Hey, we're live. We're live. After an agonizing two minute countdown, right? <laughs> seems seems long, but like some of the some of the commercials are more than two minutes long sometimes. So, all right, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks and welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, Coded Live. Uh, it's uh, it's Friday, right? It is Friday. It's better be Friday. Uh, so um, welcome to Code It Live. Uh, you know, this has been a, a fun week. We are kind of utilizing the whole week to um, unpack all the things uh, that are in our R1 release for, uh, you know, Teleric and Kenda UI and all of our productivity uh, tools. Uh, today is the productivity suite that we're going to kind of unpack and a lot of different things we're going to talk about. Um, so I'll be your, uh, you know, um, MC, um, uh, the dumb one who doesn't know anything. So I brought some smart, intelligent people who know what they're talking about. So I'm your host, Sam Basu. I will let uh, the rest of the gang introduce yourself. So maybe we go you know, clockwise. So Eve. Yes, thanks for having me, Sam. Excited to be here, and don't let Sam fool you. He knows a lot of things. So, but appreciate the compliments to start off the webinar. Uh, I am a developer relations advocate. I work with Sam on the team, and I'm responsible for all things Fiddler. Michelle. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I forgot to unmute it. Uh, my name is uh, Mikhail Vodov, uh, and I'm the engineering manager and product manager for Just Mock. So, anything that you uh, want to ask about your testing, please start. So. All right, and Peter. Hey, good evening from it's evening here from the beautiful part of uh, Europe, beautiful Friday evening. But I'm sure we're going to have some uh, fun. I'm Peter part of the sales engineering team here in uh, progress. And I happen to know a bit of uh, UI testing, automation, and all kind of stuff that can save you effort, pains, and, uh, and stuff. Yeah. And Mr. Rick. Good morning, Sam. It's very much morning here in the greater <laughs> Boston area. <laughs> um, I'm Rick Helwich, uh, principal support engineer. I've been working with reporting suites for nearly a decade now, so wow. I know one or two tricks. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm excited to be back. I haven't screwed up uh, screwed up yet, so they invited me back. I'll have to try harder. <laughs> I think um, I'm about to hit like 10 years um, at the company, I think in March. So I think, Rick, you are a little older in terms of like company age uh, uh, compared to me. Yeah. So um, here's how um, maybe we are thinking of doing this. Um, so, uh, you know, the magic of technology, we are all on the same screen, but um, Peter and Misha are actually in Sofia, Bulgaria. And uh, they, they look like uh, slightly older gentlemen. They probably want to go to bed soon. Uh, so we, <laughs> we, will let, we will let them go first. Uh, and, and Rick, Eve, and me are on East Coast time in the Americas. So we will take you uh, through to the rest. Uh, yeah, and good morning to our fellow friend here, Catherine. Uh, Catherine unpacked all the things for React. Um, that was uh, Wednesday. It's been a busy week. Um, so, all right, let's uh, start with Test Studio and Test Automation. So uh, the things that we're going to talk about today, uh, agenda-wise, so we're going to start with Test Studio, which is all things for your UI automation. Uh, you know, be productive and, uh, you know, having more confidence as your shipping software. Then we get into unit testing that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, just mock and mocking uh, solutions that where we can help. Then we switch gears to maybe some Fiddler because uh, everyone needs like network profiling and what's happening. Uh, Eve's got some really cool things to show. And then uh, Rick and me are going to talk about reporting, which is uh, maybe uh, maybe not as you know uh, fancy at times, but Rick always tries to make things a little bit more fun for our reporting. So let's go and uh, let's have Peter, if you're ready, I'm going to bring up your desktop. Yep, and, absolutely. Uh, and yep, up we go. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. So hello, one more time, um, everyone uh, here. Before we dive uh, into the new features released for uh, Test Studio, so let's uh, quickly take a look uh, at what it is. And usually, um, this is the way I do it, uh, uh, where I try to, to present uh, our new latest and greatest in Test Studio. Let's go back a little bit and see the big picture. Uh, Right, because you know, without understanding the prerequisites, it's very difficult to know the facts. And the fact is that with Test Studio, with our latest release, we now support full integration with um, Docker container. 
so that you can ease your CI CD process even further. And this is the big picture I wanted to talk uh, about a little bit. CI CD CD, whatever they want to call it, uh, you know, C continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment and, um, and stuff. Just a little bit allow me to go through the main benefits. We all know, I mentioned at the very beginning, the idea, the very idea of automation is to save you time, save you pains and bring you money. It's simple like that. I mean, no matter what, uh, we can talk one or two hours about it, but this is the, the final goal that we want, which re which, re which will result sorry, in a happier team and much easier collaboration. That's it. And um, we're starting now with the testing, with the, with the unit testing, with the debugging. We're going to break a little bit uh, the process and leave those uh, two guys and leave their superpowers in coding afterwards after the tests so let's do it uh, let's do it like um like that but you know guys uh, an essential part testing is the essential part from the entire ci cd cd process so without without making sure that your application is um, fully clear of uh, bugs um, you cannot go to market actually you can technically but uh, you'll be very soon out of it if you if you ask me <laughs> uh, for that. I don't know. So, Rick, Rick and my code never breaks. Uh, absolutely. That's why we're not going to test it uh, today. I fully trust you guys um, or not. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. And long story short is uh, test. Do you even test? Uh, let me show you my favorite t-shirt. Do you even test now? Yeah. I always wear it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> of, uh, of that. Um, yeah, a very quick intro. Allow me to spend a minute on Test Studio. It's a um, full fledged, complete product for UI automation, be it of uh, any web interface that exists out there or WPF um, application. Applications fully automated. You just point and click to record some fancy tests. So, what we're going to take a look uh, today. And of course, as a auxiliary function, you can unleash your coding skills, which uh, if you want, which we're also going to take um, a look at quickly today for integrated with bug tracking systems, CI, CD, CD uh, environments and servers, and with the latest version with um, Docker as well, crossing fingers that my computer now can sustain the sharing, the containers and the Azure DevOps. So we can have a nice five minutes of, uh, demonstration today right and um let's go uh, saying that i'm going to switch to test studio on uh, on my environment and i yeah no i was gonna say peter like yeah. what you just mentioned like that is covering you know most of enterprise dev like you got desktop covered and you got pretty much all things web you don't care like how the web apps are written in right? absolutely what frameworks yeah and you know the, this whole uh, DevOps, uh, you know, the we talk about the cycles getting closer to developers. Like it's much more tighter now, and like we developers need to know what's what's going on. How is it that our CI/CD pipelines are running? How is how is it, it we are shipping software essentially? Without this, we are, you know, just shooting in the dark. Absolutely, and quality is does always uh, matter. Again, uh, so the, the easier. It does, uh, the better. I say easier, um, don't take my words for granted. Configuration, uh, I can't promise that uh, it's a breeze. You need to invest a few minutes uh, or hours, who knows, in configuring that all the bits and pieces work together with all the environments, including the tests and test lists and test studio. But eventually this time will pay off. And this is not a marketing trick. I'm talking from experience because doing this um, every day here. Um, so, um, and yeah. Um, let's see if the configurations will work today. And uh, I'm going to start with a quick test, uh, which I'm recording against uh, IMDb, then searching for some movies. I have no idea why I selected James Bond today. Maybe I feel in the mood uh, for James Bond recently. So what I created uh, for you guys in advance, of course, uh, I don't want, to, don't want it to waste too much time now creating the test uh, from scratch is uh, I'm going to get a random James Bond movie uh, title. Since Test Studio is a point-and-click recorder and basically we can extract it 
from the web, from WAN interface. Honestly, I was looking for a good UI generator for uh, for James Bond movies, but I couldn't find. Uh, sorry, and I didn't have enough time to build it myself. So I chose uh, the coded functions of uh, Test Studio, creating a little helper class here. Um, don't take a look at my code, uh, please. But I'm going to shuffle through four James Bond movies. Uh, Sam, do you have a favorite, by the way, out of those? Uh, yeah. tough, tough question. Yeah, mine, too, mine as well. So I'm uh, going to shuffle uh, through, through these guys um, here. And then I'm going to check a few movie databases, like the movie database itself or IMDb, and check what's the overall score of, uh, of those guys, right? And see if it is uh, above, uh, above a certain uh, level. Uh, or or not, in our case above uh, above seven, and lock all the results and um, use them as uh, variables so we can display it, uh, them somewhere. This entire logic, except as I said, except for the random helper class, is uh, written without the necessity of uh, coding, almost right. With the point and, uh, point and click, I go extract the movie title and then uh, then search it. This is how Test Studio Test Studio works. Right, and the idea of the two is that after you have recorded such test from any any UI interface, um, an interface uh, out there, you can uh, schedule it as many times as you want. And uh, we're going to underline today the the scheduling itself because this is the idea. This is a time saver. I'm going to show you different ways to schedule the tests, uh, be it from the tool itself, be it integrated with a Docker container, or be it integrated with. Um, CI CD servers like Azure DevOps or, or um, Mingo through them, etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's that's the idea. But let's go and quickly see the test. I'm quite proud of it. I'm going to execute it uh, for a second now so we can uh, all see what's uh, going to happen. It's completely randomly generated. So bear with us and let's see what's going to, to happen now. Casino Real, my favorite, by the way, as well. It definitely has a score above seven. So our test should pass. My condition is that the movie has a result above seven. Let me bring my screen. And, and this seven is like the, the IMDb score, right? Uh, or, yep, the, the, the IMDb system? score from the movie itself. So now I'm going to generate and shuffle one of those four guys that I had in my class um, here. And those annotations show what's happening on the screen. That's why the speed is a little bit slower, but you can understand actually what's uh, yeah. what's gonna what's gonna what's gonna happen. And we're going to to move through through those in uh, with um, four times, right? Okay. And uh, I'm going to show you later on what's uh, what's happening. So we're, while this is uh, yeah. coming up, so uh, the the coded step was like navigate to imdb.com, and then uh -huh. Uh -huh. you you have the uh, one piece of code where you are um, providing those movie names. Yep. And then yep. you're randomly choosing between one of those. Yes. Yes. Like uh, you have a navigation step. The very cool part here, uh, uh, thank you for bringing this up, is that. Um, it's again on the um, time and effort uh, saving. Uh, let's say that this is my development environment, right? IMDb. I'm going to check something when I develop, right? Uh, when I plug it into my CI CD. Uh, very easily, I can move this test to whatever environment uh, I wish. Uh, no need to re record it from scratch. All I need to do is modify the base URL of the test, and I can bring this navigation step to another mm -hmm. environment uh, of my choice be it testing, staging, uh, production, or whatever. I have prepared here with uh, the help of my colleagues one little PowerShell script here, which can done literally this with um, with a click of a button, right? This is the type of automation we all strive, uh, we all strive uh, for. I have those variables where I can uh, point uh, different uh, environment URL or different tests that can be executed. And all you need to do is run the, the power the PowerShell um, to do that. So this is very powerful, and you can do it either manually by executing a few clicks from Test Studio, or with such uh, scripts. Um, yeah. 
if you want. And, and, and in the yeah. chat room, uh, by the way, um, yeah, this is your chance to you know ask away any questions. These are the actual engineers uh, yeah. and team members who work on our stuff. So fire away any questions you might have. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, let's see what's happening with the test uh, in the meantime. Sorry about that. Uh, we're still on track here on time. So give it uh, give it a shot and then we continue with um, the containerization uh, here. So this is the idea. What I'm showing you at the moment, guys, I'm executing the test on my personal environment. This is the laptop. This is the, the machine where I have installed uh, Test Studio and it's um, scheduling and executing service and, uh, services. But you can move this, right? Oh, we generated Spectre. Nice. I think it's not that highly reviewed. Let's take a look. 6.8. It should fail hmm. now because I'm only checking for 7 and above. And I'm going to display this on screen with the yellow annotation. So, ah, my beautiful Regex. Come on, Regex. Do your magic. Uh, so uh, yeah, you can uh, you can also use regex by the way to to automate some of the tests uh, if you're comfortable with that. It's not mandatory, but it, it helps if you want. Uh, so uh, the idea was that I'm executing here locally on my machine. All uh, right, but I can move this. Uh, I can schedule it uh, into any physical virtual machine within my environment that can talk uh, to Test Studio. Imagine, uh, there we go. The rating is six point eight, and it. Uh, is displaying it. Uh, so imagine that you have hundreds or thousands of tests, uh, right? Uh, unless they're coding like you and Rick flawlessly and they don't need that many tests. Uh, but still imagine you have those hundreds of tests and if you execute them one after another, it will take you a lot of uh, time because you need to wait them. But you can distribute them. You can do load balancing and stuff across different environments and machines. Uh, and this happens, uh, you can do it either locally in the network or connect to, to Azure DevOps, um, any other CI CD uh, system and use them. And recently you can use uh, containers with, uh, with that, right? So uh, another movie that has less than seven rating, totally random, sorry, maybe, because in real will be generated uh, soon. We have just four times uh, to generate um, and the task so the test should be almost um, almost done. Um, and yes. So Peter, quick question yeah. here. Um, maybe a dumb question because I just don't know enough. So for you to run this in um, in, in a container, uh, what type of setup do you need? Like, do you need Test Studio installed on everyone? Uh, are there things you can do with scripting? Hopefully not. All you need to do is we use our runner, the so-called uh, Test Studio Runtime. It's uh, it's a proprietary, by the way, runner which we uh, proprietary framework which we built in-house uh, many years ago um, here in Telerik. So um, all you need to do is on the same machine where your uh, containers are to have this runtime, this running agent only. You don't need to have the full-blown. Uh, mm -hmm. Test Studio installation on it. And the same is valid, by the way. Over here, we have something above seven, so it's uh, going to pass this time. So, and the same, uh, the same thing is valid for your CI CD configurations. Uh, for example, we go to Azure DevOps and um, we need to configure an agent um, so that uh, the pipeline triggers automated tests with Test Studio. So, all you need to do is on the same machine, on the same uh, environment, to have this little runtime edition of Test Studio along with your um, self-hosted agent. Or if you have a hosted agent, uh, if you're using Azure DevOps and have a hosted agent, you need to add the runtime on this hosted agent. And that's it. Uh, installation is uh, quite easy, you know, with uh, one or two lines of scripts uh, to move them. And um, and there you go. Actually, I, I can I can show you uh, I can show you how it is done for um, for Docker uh, for Docker now since um, our test is uh, finishing. No, this is getting interesting. Right we're looking yeah. at Bond and you're deploying agents. I'm getting very good. <laughs> now we're talking about agents. I didn't, uh, yeah. <laughs> and there we have our favorite movie of us both, uh, Casino Real. Uh, just to let you know uh, here, guys, what happened um, in Test Studio itself. It executed since we decided to, gen to run the test four times and we generated four different movie titles. The test executed in four iterations generated a movie each. 
So each iteration has its own status, right? And when we generated the Casino Royale stuff, all passed here, you can see the walk for each of those uh, sessions. You can see what was oh, nice. generated and its, uh, its core, right? Um, uh, for that. And the thing is that I was waiting. Do you notice that I was waiting for the browser for Google Chrome for the test to finish to execute it so I can switch and show you a uh, thing. This is not mandatory to happen with uh, with Test Studio because uh, we also support headless mode. You know, I can run the entire test, the same test in Chrome headless, meaning that I can continue to use my machine in the meantime, right? Mm -hmm. Do some stuff uh, on screen sharing. The test will be executed much faster. And actually, the way we work especially with Docker, uh, is only with uh, headless mode uh, of execution so that you can continue to use um, your machine. Uh, everything is configured in advance, of course, my Docker environment here. And uh, I have a guy who is uh, running here. So all we need to do in advance, in advance, bring the installer of Test Studio. This is uh, mandatory. Let me just uh, bring my local environment uh, uh, here. So all you need to do is uh, in uh, the Docker host path uh, folders to bring initially the Test Studio runtime installer, this little stripped version I was talking about, that is our execution agent, and the Chrome installer, mm -hmm. right? So they need to go, they need to go there. They need to be on the image in advance in order to set it up, uh, you know, it's really, literally very easy with uh, with a quick um, script. And then you bring to the Docker hosted path of the project uh, of your choice, my beautiful test project, which I should have re renamed to James Bond or something like that, but uh, sorry for that. And you take care, Docker will take care uh, from, um, from, there, from there on. So what I need to find uh, from the COI of the image, we need to find uh, the place where we have installed the runtime agent. So I don't know it by heart, so sorry about that. So let's see where it is. It's progress. Uh, studio, hopefully, yep. And, uh, studio and uh, almost there, it's in the... You, you typed the test studio wrong. Uh, did I? Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I had to set up a new environment uh, so that it's able to to sustain everything. So I'm not accustomed to the to the keyboard. Um, yeah. So uh, what we're doing uh, here, we're navigating to the to the Vitamin store that we need to do, and uh, you, you can script it. Uh, this don't get me wrong. Uh, this is the idea of automation uh, itself. So uh, you can. Script it and bring up uh, the location of uh, mm. of the runner. It's called Art of Test uh, Runner, and then you, all you need to point is uh, the list. So let me save some time here, right, and go to the Art of Test Runner. Now, do you need to be in the in the bin uh, or the bin? It... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Bin. No, I can find it. Connector. No, runner. Here, here we go. So we navigate to the runner um, itself, and then we need to just paste uh, paste the list and uh, enter the magic. And upon execution. The, everything will run in a, in a headless mode, right? Uh, we're not going to be able to see anything because um, it's headless. Headless mode will be executed. Uh, at the moment, Chrome is fully, fully supported, meaning that I can continue sharing my screen now and uh, go to other environments and show you the, the other ways of um, executing such uh, tests, uh, for example, while we run uh, in the background uh, here. And I do have uh, Azure DevOps uh, configured as well, by the way, guys. Um, so in advance, of course, I have this um, runtime agent, which I have placed on the same uh, machine. We like and your d desktop. Uh, you yeah, have. I know. I know we don't have uh, presentations uh, for today, but I prepared a little presentation now 
with the two most important questions, uh, at least for what I'm doing, right? I always ask why something doesn't work, but I'm even more curious when it actually works. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> so it, it is the so harder it's... question, like for, uh, you know, developer when something works and we don't know why it's working, it is very agonizing. <laughs> exactly. Right. A apart from don't touch it, if it works, it means <laughs> no matter that you don't know um, why it is, um, why it is done. Right. So as you can see, the test is um, being executed again. We are randomly generated those um, guys uh, here and checking the regex and, and uh, the scores uh, definitely much, much quicker. I always encourage the customers why you have um, configured uh, everything and uh, make sure that your tests are perfect. Then you can schedule them in um, headless mode execution because it's like three to five or even more times uh, quicker and saves you a lot of um, hassle, especially when you have uh, many, 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 many test lists, uh, right? So once uh, this finish one more time, we'll be able to um, enjoy the, the other way. Um, and while this is finishing, like, so yeah. when you, when you do this in Azure or any other, you know, mm -hmm. DevOps type uh, service, you would do essentially the same thing. You will have your script and you will Absolutely. make sure the runner is there and you launch and Absolutely. you make that as part of your, you know, build pipeline. Absolutely. Um, once you, you attach uh, the agent, uh, by the way, I promised that you can, uh, that I can switch to Azure DevOps, but I forgot that my Azure DevOps instance at the moment is running on Chrome. It's not on any other browser. So unfortunately, we need to wait, although it's uh, <laughs> it's headless. <laughs> it's headless mode. Uh, I just need the same browser, uh, Chrome itself, but uh, we'll be with us. But yeah, to your question, um, absolutely. Um, the agent um, itself, once uh, it's configured in the pipeline, you just need to have a COI task, very, very, very simple COI task. And this COI task needs to have the same point the runner, point the list, uh, and there you go. You can, you can enjoy um, everything um, out, of, uh, out of the box. And uh, yeah, perfectly, we had movies below seven. So some of our tests um, passed, uh, failed um, here. So uh, if we have a minute or so, Sam, I can quickly show you Azure DevOps uh, here, the setup, at least the setup itself. No need to, to run the pipelines. And, um, yeah, yeah, we, we do. We do. Uh, yeah, perfect. As long as Michel, who's waiting and doesn't fall asleep, we're um, good. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Michel. No, it's Friday night. Uh, fine, yeah, you know, but, uh, I'm pretty sure you're having fun watching Test Studio as well. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, here's a little setup that I um, have in the DevOps. So yeah, some uh, what you what you asked. Um, to my agent, I just attach a very, very, very simple uh, COI. Um, task uh, here, of course, I can later publish on the result. I can even add a task for a Docker uh, container here, uh, but let's not uh, let's not get that complicated uh, at the moment. Maybe we can show this uh, some other time. But with my with my little script, I'm pointing um, the agent to the um, our runner and to the same very test list. And you know the magic when you run the pipeline when you have everything. Compiled the tests, so yeah. we'll glad to execute afterwards. I think you kind of said it at the beginning, where uh, like the, there is a little bit of like magical stuff going on in here because you need to spend that time configuring everything, and Absolutely. once you put in that investment, then your build pipelines go much more smoother. Yeah, and the same is valid by automation. I cannot promise you guys that I mean, we're not reinventing the wheels there. Uh, you know, you need to invest some time in order to get some time. This is how right. everything works, not yeah. only in testing and development, but in life uh, itself. Um, automation, uh, depending on the learning cur curve and the background, uh, you need to, 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 to have some investment a little, a little bit. But then it definitely pays off. Pays off uh, of later, right? Uh, like you just sit, enjoy, wonder why everything works out of the box and see how the pipeline is triggered and the agent is doing its uh, job running the test um, at, uh, yeah. at the moment, which will eventually pass or fail depending on the results. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's running the, essentially the same thing now yeah. In, yeah. in Azure as compared to uh, yeah. in, in Docker. 
Yeah. Right. No, uh, no, no need to to to, to wait it, uh, guys. Um, okay. yeah. If you if you ask me. So. So, so um, let let me ask you this. Um, mm. You know, um, uh, the test studios team. You folks have been busy. Um, what's uh, what's next? What are you uh, excited about? Oh, definitely. Uh, we can do a little sneak uh, sneak peek um, here. So, you know, Test Studio exists uh, also as um, Visual Studio uh, plugin. Right. So, as we speak, we are almost um, uh, deploying uh, the 2022 uh, support uh, for Visual Studio. Uh, something else that we are working on, I don't want to commit uh, on it. I don't want to give any time frames or stuff. I can literally sneak peek uh, a little bit. Uh, but you know, at the moment we can automate any UI interface uh, that exists out there, no matter the technology. We can also do WPF uh, automation, but if I wanted to automate the clicks on my Docker interface, or if I wanted to automate uh, the clicks on my email day to day, this kind of desktop uh, automation is not there yet for Test Studio. But maybe I'm saying that uh, we will have something to show you throughout uh, the year uh, today. So hold on for for more details. Okay. On that. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. So yeah, there you have it, folks. Uh, if you're looking for you know test automation for all of your web and desktop uh, you know apps, and you want to build up a pipeline for your CI/CD. Um, you have all the tools required to, you know, get you started with test automation. So take a look at okay. Test Studio and uh, Peter. And uh, I know you are you are standing, uh, you know, in front of a big team that's pouring in their, you know, blood and sweat. Maybe not blood, uh, but definitely <laughs> sweat. Uh, so you know, keep on churning, keep on giving us good stuff at okay. release. Big thanks to the team. If somebody is uh, here and listening, because they're great guys. All right. So, um, Misho, if you are ready, we could uh, switch gears and talk about mocking. And I see yeah. uh, Rick is back in the uh, in the back room. Probably went to get some coffee. Yeah, welcome back, Rick. All right. So, um, Peter, I'm going to take your uh, desktop down. Oh okay. yeah. And uh, Misho, let us know when when you're ready. I see oh, it. I'm ready. Yeah. I... yeah. There you go. Okay, nice. So uh, I'll talk uh, about uh, just more and uh, our uh, current release, uh, R1.22, and uh, what we've done, uh, and mainly and mostly we've done one grade of uh, performance improvement. Uh, we also officially released the support for the official version of .NET 6 and uh, Visual Studio 2022. And uh, we are claiming support for C Sharp 10. Uh, why I say claiming support is uh, that we uh, tested uh, if uh, GSMOC works with um, uh, all of the features that uh, C Sharp uh, 10 is uh, providing. And it seems that uh, everything works as expected. And uh, there is a bit of a new configuration that you can enable or disable uh, performance optimizations depending on your scenario and uh, what uh, you want to test. So to, to show that, probably it's a good idea first to explain what is GSMOP. Let me just open the project. Yeah, I'm talking just talking while I'm muted. So I was going to suggest like just what Peter did, just give us like a 30 second pitch of what is just mock. And before you do that, I wanted to acknowledge, I, I think uh, I, I, I know who this is. This is Andy Progressor. It could be uh, somebody else, but I think this is Andy Whelan. It's our good friend. So Andy and Peter know, you know, testing and UI automation inside out. So yeah, please reach out to us uh, for any questions. They'll, they're here to help. All right, Misha. What is this and just mock? Yeah, so uh, the latest mock is a mocking framework that uh, helps you isolate your uh, code from any dependency that uh, a particular code may have, and uh, with the with the goal for you to test it in, in isolation from all of those uh, dependencies. And uh, as a mocking framework, uh, just mock is uh, probably the most powerful on the market, as we can. Uh, mock uh, literally everything uh, at this point, uh, meaning that uh, we can mock uh, 
not only interfaces, virtual and uh, abstract methods and properties. We can mock uh, static classes, uh, we can mock uh, delegates, we can mock even uh, non-public members types, local functions, uh, refer return values, the real imports, uh, and uh, even any classes that uh, or uh, method that uh, you think of, uh, even uh, those that are parts of uh, MS Core uh, members, and uh, which are essentially the system API. And yeah, in essence, just more helps you is you let your code to test it. Yeah, and it, it, it's all about that isolation, right? Because otherwise, like yeah, you, you can't can't unit test when you have so many dependencies on you know every type of service or database call, whatever you might have. Yeah, and uh, when you when you want to. Um, when you have, let's say, a thousand or ten thousand uh, unit tests, uh, when a particular test fails, you want to know only from the name of that test to know what happens inside it and what uh, what's broken. Let's say if you develop new feature and uh, five of uh, the unit tests uh, are broken, you just see the name of the unit test and you know, hey, I forgot something. And uh, if uh, you don't isolate the uh, your code from the dependencies, and if such dependency fail, you will have to go and debug uh, that unit test to understand what's happening. Uh, for example, if the connection with your database is uh, broken, then um, you wouldn't know. You, you have to go and uh, just uh, debug it and uh, check if that's the issue or not. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So you are saying you uh, and the team have done a bunch of work in terms of performance. So uh, yeah. what, what, what yeah. changed? Well, a lot have changed. Uh, we made uh, just more work on demand, and I will show you what that means. Uh, from the JustMock extensions, we added uh, an options menu. Actually, we renamed the the old options menu is now integrations, and it shows you uh, where is the window? Yeah, here it is. This is the integrations with uh, all other profilers uh, that are inst uh, currently installed on uh, uh, my computer. So we renamed that to have more suitable name, and the new options window actually as allows you to um, enable that on-demand instrumentation that we've uh, done and to, uh, to emphasize on that, uh, I will explain how JustMock worked before that. So the, the ability of JustMock to mock literally everything comes from the fact that JustMock is adding uh, pieces of code to each method that is executed by the CLR. And based on that code, we filter uh, on certain conditions if something additional should be done or not. And uh, with that on-demand uh, optimization, we are no longer using uh, doing that, at least at uh, most of the time. And um, we are doing it uh, on-demand, uh, essentially when we uh, find something like mocha range, we then send an instruction to the CR to add that additional code that we want for that particular uh, class and method. So, so Misha, essentially what yeah. you what you're describing like that that is the instrumentation that you know any yeah, that's the instrumentation. Does. So you're saying you're not going to attach to things until like the CLR is needing it at runtime. Yeah, like 90% of the time we won't do anything in a additional for things that we don't know if you're going to use it or not. Because previously, we are doing that for a purpose that that we just don't know what the developer will try to mock or not. And now we know. Uh, we, we can follow the API and just send requests to the CLR to recompile, right. recompile stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see why that will have a big performance benefit in you know, how the app launches and how the test suite is run. Yeah, and uh, previously, uh, not uh, just your code was instrumented, and uh, uh, but essentially every code that is uh, executed was uh, instrumented. Let's say uh, the code of a VS test or the host uh, that is pulling from the VS test uh, console and 
everything literally that is compiled is uh, intercepted. So the on-demand option uh, is uh, now uh, released as beta, uh, as we have a few things to 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 fix to to make it work uh, correctly for uh, every scenario. I will show you uh, what I'm talking about. So uh, the demand uh, I will first execute. Uh, this is the uh, .NET framework uh, examples that are delivered with. Uh, this is for uh, framework uh, for six. But uh, yeah, I will execute them without the optimization just uh, of our enabled, and we will check what time it will be required for that task to execute. Well. I'm expecting around 20 seconds. So this is not uh, not yet enabled by default. It's a choice. No, it's not choice. yet uh, enabled uh, by default because, uh, as I said, uh, with uh, with the instrumentation of, of the code on the CLR level, uh, so many things can go wrong. And we fixed mm -hmm. enormous amount of uh, problems that uh, we could, couldn't even imagine. And for that reason, we want to uh, to make sure that this is not the default uh, uh, option for now. But uh, let's say in a few releases, when we fix everything uh, uh, that we know of and uh, the things that uh, our clients report, uh, we will try to make it the default uh, option. So this is no, currently so it's done. 30, it took what? Yeah, yeah, almost ten seconds. Oh, 45 or which one are, are we reading? Well, I'm 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 uh, oh, reading that one. checking seconds, the, yeah. the one from the output because mm -hmm. uh, here in the text explorer there are some uh, sometimes the estimation is uh, th those numbers are actually estimations from the beginning and sometimes they are actually not entirely correct. But mm -hmm. yeah, this is why uh, I prefer to to check the, sure. the whole time which is in the output. So now I will open the options and enable the on demand and execute them again. And we are expecting very significant uh, reduction. So typically, for the worst case scenario, uh, the optimization is around uh, 40%. And uh, yes. for the best case scenario, the optimization is uh, around 90%. And um, what I mean by worst case, worst case is when um, every single method in your code is actually mocked up in some of your unit tests, which is typically not the case. Yeah. So, so what, no, okay, good. Oh, it looks like it, it's already done. Yeah, it's already done. And you can see a reduction of around 14 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, which is which is an amazing yeah, achievement. I say, at least we are, we are proud of, of that achievement. Very very nice. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah absolutely. So uh, we have. So other... Misha, bef before yeah. you uh, switch to the next thing, just a quick shout out to a couple of you know community things. Our good friend uh, Bald Bearded Builder is here. Hello hello. Uh, so, um, DBB <laughs> Dev, right? Uh, you, you folks want to go to that? I think it starts uh, Monday, right? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, uh, you know, our friend will be back streaming, and you know, the community is uh, kind of stepping up uh, to kind of uh, cheer him on. So, uh, it's it's quite an elite uh, group. I think uh, you have to have three conditions: you need to be a dev, you need to be bald, and you need to have a beard, and then you're awesome. Uh, so, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I was I was joking with Eve that you know uh, all I have to do to get ready to stream is just put on a hat. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we're getting there. And you know, speaking of you know the community. Um, so uh, today is Friday. Next Friday, uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Fritz, uh, C-Sharp Fritz, um, back on Code It Live, and he's going to do some Blazor stuff. I uh, use some of the newer components that we have in the release in uh, ClipTalk, which is his app. So uh, fun times coming up. Sorry, Misha, go on. Yeah, so the other options are actually specific uh, for the features that uh, you want to uh, to, to use and that have a great impact over the performance. And one of those features is uh, DOL import. And if you don't actually mock anything that is related to DOL import, you can turn it from, uh, to false. And uh, another option is the automatic mock, mock, uh, mock repository cleanup. 
uh, option that in essence is uh, disabling a functionality that uh, at the end of each unit test that contains um, a reference to uh, to just mock, we are inserting a mock reset, which is like that. Mock reset to just reset the the uh, the mocks that are created in that uh, unit test. So why are we doing that? Well, uh, because um, when you create a mock for a static API, we don't know. Uh, when that uh, this this, uh, this static API is not related to an object, as we all know, and uh, we don't know when this object should be released. Should be uh, released in the beginning of the test, or should be released somewhere in the end, or in another test. We don't know that. So uh, this is why we insert that uh, mock reset. And uh, to even uh, make one step further, you can add uh, this mock reset manually to all of your tests and uh, disable disable it from here. And you will be you will uh, uh, you will receive uh, an additional performance boost. But uh, I do not recommend uh, to uh, this option to be disabled if uh, you do not uh, add it to all of your uh, unit tests. Uh, because it will lead to memory leaks. Yeah. yeah. So Makes just sense. use it with caution. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So uh, all of this right now uh, that you are running, like this example, this is uh, running on .NET Framework. And uh, what, what version of Visual Studio is this for you? This version of Visual Studio is actually... Uh, oh, no, it's your the examples, Yeah, the examples are for .NET Framework for uh, sure, sure. 2019, but this is uh, Visual Studio uh, 2022. Oh, so you're, you're kind of proving it right here that uh, everything works yeah. in 2022. Nice. That's Absolutely, nice. yeah. I was uh, actually uh, wanting to also execute the new version that we are actually currently adding for 2022, the, the examples for uh, 2022, which are targeting .NET 6. Nice, there we go. So very quickly, I will uh, execute that. I will uh, disable the, that to just show you something, which we failed to do. <laughs> We are currently, uh, uh, when we use the uh, on-demand uh, option, uh, we still have issues with the DOL import, and uh, uh, which we will try to fix it for the upcoming service pack. And uh, if something uh, can be done in that time frame, we'll probably uh, go for the R2. So uh, the time that was required is uh, Starting test of no, actually it's six point seven, uh, and uh, which means that if you write uh, your application on .NET six, everything is extremely light and fast. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. guys, I am really recommending you to switch your application to use the yep. latest version of .NET. And, and th there's something to be said about, you know, just uh, like since like .NET Core, since we have broken away from .NET Framework, uh, everything mm -hmm. is modular. And even if you don't use some of the latest features, it makes sense to just update the runtime of your app because it's not going to break everything else uh, in your systems. And you just gain so much of the performance and your unit tests run faster with, um, you know, just mock. So, yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, do I have one more minute? Or? Sure, sure, sure. One more minute. I, yeah, I can show something that uh, uh, to to get the uh, data performance, we need to make uh, two sacrifices, and one of the sacrifices is to uh, the the mocking of the new operator, which I will show like it used to be and how it should be done. So. Maybe, uh, uh, Misha, since you're showing code here, maybe just uh, uh, zoom, uh, zoom in. Yeah, zoom in a little bit more. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, previously, you could just uh, mock arrange uh, the new operator and return a predefined object with uh, specific properties that uh, you wanted to, to do. And now, the appropriate way to do it actually. 
my workaround was in the other solution. So, so the, the current way to do is just uh, to move the new operator and uh, the, the previous way was that and the current way is uh, to to just uh, arrange the property of uh, the type that you want uh, use the ignore instance uh, method and uh, then again return the, the test value for that property. This is one of the backing changes that uh, we had to do in order to, to get that performance. Unfortunately, we don't have any workaround for that. And the second breaking change I will show it here. The previous way to is uh, how you use the arrange set, uh, which is uh, actually setting uh, the value of a property. The previous way was to just use the, the method uh, uh, like that, and now you can you have to specify who is the type that is owner of that property. And the reason for that is uh, because uh, in that uh, uh, method to we use an action to just have the ability to to apply a value to a property in a lambda function and uh, from the action we can't actually get uh, who is the owner of that property in some specific uh, scenarios let's say like uh, internal classes in a nested class or stuff like that so not in a, every case but in some cases and for that reason we decided to throw an exception when our sets is used with the on-demand option and the alternative is to use it like that. yeah and no, it makes, it makes sense yeah because i mean this this is a this is a big change this is kind of uh you know Absolutely. undoing and redoing a lot of the ways in which just mark works so it's our first step this release and things are only going to get better um performance wise as more things uh, settle down so yeah awesome misha thank you thank you and the whole team um you know for giving us uh just mock and making us more productive with our uh testing and mocking all right and uh oh i see our good friend eve is back even we'll bring you on uh from the back rooms there you are all right michelle um uh, so i'm gonna bring uh your screen down uh if you are done oh there you go uh, so, um, hold on, did I lose anybody? No, I'm, I'm still on, I thought I was muted, but okay. So, um, Misha, Peter, you are more than welcome to, you know, kind of hang out with us, uh, unless it's Friday evening for you, you have to go get a drink. We understand, but if not, uh, we would love to kind of have you here. Um, all right. So Eve, shall we switch to Fiddler? Yes. Thank you. One of these yeah. days I have to remember to ask to go first because I follow some really <laughs> impressive speakers and then I start thinking it through and second guessing wow. myself, but at least I'm Be careful what you ask for. We might have <laughs> you go uh, on, on um, the webinar. I wanted to get uh, ahead oh. of Rick this time. So at least I did that. <laughs> <laughs> right. dead. And I'm always so jealous of uh, um, Eve here. And uh, Eve, I'm going to bring up your desktop because uh, Eve gets to talk about Fiddler, which is amazing. Yes. Well, I've been borrowing Sam's line, which is it's Fiddler time. Um, yes. And I like that. Just kind of sets the tone. Uh, we're going to keep it you know, light here today, but there's a lot to unpack with our Fiddler Everywhere 3.0 release. And one of the things I wanted to show you is that you know, Fiddler Everywhere is more of a family of products now. A lot of you are probably familiar with Fiddler Classic, which is our Windows only version, but it's evolved. You know, we have Fiddler Everywhere, which is now the cross platform version running on Windows, Mac, and Linux. We also have Fiddler Jam, which is troubleshooting. We have Fiddler Core, which is more of that engine. Um, and so it is really blossomed. But what we're going to focus on today is Fiddler Everywhere. This is what uh, we put a lot of our efforts behind in this last release and delivered some really amazing features. The thing, things that people have been asking for or we've listened to that serves the needs. Um, so just a quick overview like everyone else did. Fiddler Everywhere, you know, at its um, element is a web debugging proxy. And what it allows you to do is really just go in and identify network traffic using the live traffic grid. It allows you to, you know, test and debug applications. And it's really just a powerful tool um, that lets you modify responses and just integrates into your workflow, right? This Filter Everywhere is that product that you don't use it when you just have a problem. 
you keep it in your toolbox and you make sure that you don't are stuck in a situation where you have a high consequence error because you're always testing these things. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna take you through a couple of the demos today, but that's really what I wanna show you just kind of what it is. Yeah, and then you kind of said it right, because like it's just uh, such a part of like developer DNA is like in the last you know 20 years, like we, we have kind of grown up with Fiddler, uh, you know, trying to see everything that's going on under the network stack. Yes. I'll put, um, I'm going to show you up here. You can still see my screen, right, Sam? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is the release blog post we did, and I can drop a link in it to it later, but we're going to go over the main things there, the HTTP2 support, which is huge in beta. That's a big one. Um, we're also going to talk about WebSocket support. I know Sam is excited about some of the beauty behind this. Um, I'm going to go over the advanced filters, and I'm also going to show you the getting started experience. Okay, let's see it. Okay, let's go. Okay, so um, from my desktop, I launched the application. I already had this installed. It's really easy. You can get a 30-day free trial. Um, you do have to create an account, but otherwise, you're good to go. This new dialog box, what this now gives you are three different approaches um, to start inspecting your traffic. So the system traffic capturing, that's the one you're going to be familiar with. You know, you go ahead, you trust the root certificate. I've already done that in this particular, so I can capture that HTTPS traffic. One of the new features of 3.0 is this pre-configured browser capturing. Okay, so let's say you don't have access to the system proxy or for some reason you're um, not empowered to trust and enable root certificates. You can now use this pre-configured browser capturing process to inspect traffic from a specific Chrome um, browser instance. So you can get that live traffic from just that particular browser so you can avoid you know, what you'd have to do for the system traffic capturing. So system traffic oh, um, capturing is, you know, your whole machine. Um, the pre-configured browser is, you know, for that specific Chrome instance. And then we also have a tutorial. You know, if you want to get into debugging mobile devices and quick start, you can do that. So this was nice. This is something. Yeah. And, and, and maybe because like Eve, you and me kind of just take things for granted. Like we are always on the left column. Like we always enable it like in full yes. proxy mode and we want to see everything, but it can be overwhelming. It's it's capturing a lot. And maybe we are not thinking that like not everybody does have admin rights to maybe trust certificates on their machine. So this is good because you can, you're just giving them a quicker way to just look at one tab in yes. Chrome. Exactly. Um, so you can get started anywhere from here. There are some other things on the right and have tutorials. I'm just going to close this out. And uh, right here is where you will see that open browser. Mm -hmm. So you go ahead, you can it starts that process. And we could put in, let's see. Oh, it's your favorite hashtag. My favorite. Mm -hmm. You know, and then uh, right away, it will start capturing the live, the live traffic mm -hmm. uh, within yeah. this live traffic um, tab. And so that's, it's super easy. It doesn't require any complicated setup. Um, you're ready to go. Yeah. We are having this conversation, uh, you know, um, for the .NET stuff. Um, I am uh, strongly in the light mode camp, like uh, okay. when, unless I'm doing like Visual Studio late at night, uh, but it looks like you and I, I see so many uh, others doing like Visual Studio dark mode all day long. I can't do that. And I, and I know it's like my fault. Uh, you, you're on the, Odd, odd one out, but I, I just like like my light studio. Or like I get it. You know, and that's a preference. And that's one thing that we did in a release prior yeah. to 3.0 is we released, um, I think, four different UI mm -hmm. themes we have now. So, you know, we still have light, we have dark, um, and then there's two kind of in between. So just, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. I found out when I do like videos and demos, this one just looks um, more compelling. You know, it just looks sharper when you're, when you're demoing it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, in the chat room, our good friend Full Schnabel is with me. <laughs> but you know, dark, dark mode is like so good for accessibility, and it's actually easier on your eyes, definitely. Yes. But, you know, preferences to each to their own. Yep. Um, and then one thing I want to show here quickly too is one of the big things is the HTTP2 yeah. support, which is in beta. And to do this, you go into settings, connections, and it's as simple as a checkbox. Nice. Um, and then right away, once you have that enabled, you're able to start capturing that HTTP2 traffic, which you can see here. Um, Interesting. And, you know, a lot of developers have to support varying protocols. And 
prior to the HTTP2 version, which a little backstory, you know, it's the latest revision of the HTTP protocol. You know, it runs on both the client and the server side. Uh, but before this, you would have, to, you didn't have that support. You wouldn't be able to go into this traffic. Um, and then you can even hone into it further. You can see here, I have a filter. I can put HTTP2 and I can filter just for that traffic. And it's also kind of nice to see like <laughs> Fiddler is almost like, um, you know, eye opening sometimes when you see what's happening behind the scenes, you get to see like what, uh, what, uh, you know, major websites are using. How many times are, you know, Apple, Google, and everybody else is kind of calling home. It shows you everything. I know. I mean, I've only had this open for a short period of time and you can just see <laughs> how many sessions yeah. that I have already. I, mean, I had cleared this earlier today I and mean, I could scroll for a long time. Um, but yeah, so it, it does give full visibility, you know, which is great. But then sometimes you just really want to hone in on traffic and that's where our filters come in. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we have this particular, you know, um, income filter, and then I'll also get in, you know, to some of the advanced filters that we have in a little bit. Cool. Let's see what I want to pull up now. I want to pull, let's go into the advanced filter. So this is something new. Let me click this open. Um, in the previous version of advanced filters, you could filter by like requests and responses. But what we did here is we really, um, broaden that to allow you to filter by protocol, by path, by status URL, you know, all these things that you can see in the drop down. Um, and, and you can hit, well, I don't, I didn't have any in there. I just had an example, but give me one second. And then you can add, you know, and there's no limit to what you can add in these mm -hmm. advanced filters. So if you want to, you know, to go by protocol, you know, by path and host, you know, and put the value in there, you can take all of that traffic, which you saw is pretty immense and really right. narrow it down to what you want to get into and allow you to um, not feel overwhelmed, yeah, but get yeah. to that root cause, root cause quickly. Can you, can you show us that drop down one more time? Like yep. what, what are some of the options? So you can go by protocol, host, status. Oh, it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, you can. Yeah, you can fine tune based on request and response headers. Yep. I mean, you, you know about it. Oh, it's in here. You know, you know, I, I actually uh, was talking to somebody, uh, the client IP thing that is actually our remote IP that is super valuable because you are uh, just doing or pinging one machine and, and that traffic is the only thing that you want to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So there are, there's just so many different options for you to get into. And um, I know we have some other sessions, but I just wanted to pull out, oh, let me just remove those real quick. Oops, hold on. I cleared most of my traffic, but yeah, so um, it's coming in. Yeah, it'll come right back. Fill up, fill up again. Yes. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna go to my. You know, and then just to show real quick, you know, we have these tabs that offer some great information. We have our overview tab. You know, we have our inspectors tab. Um, so any kind of things that you're looking for, you're going to, you know, be able to find everything. Mm -hmm. And I just want to touch on real quickly is, you know, you can click on any particular session and we can go to edit in the composer, yes. Yes. you know, and this is a really powerful feature. Um, I know you're going to get into talking some more, uh, you know, about the APIs, but this just gives you so much flexibility, um, in terms of even with HTTP2, like sending requests, mm -hmm. right? You can see here now you can test how specific requests um you can do previews things like that you can yeah. switch in between you know if you're tasked with that and you can even save them to collections yes so th this is gold because you're not starting from scratch you are looking at a pre-existing request and you're starting to manipulate and this is also kind of how you can uh, you know uh, fake things out you can have uh, you know things responded for you you can inject something in the response yes um yeah. So those are some of the, like the big things that I'm excited about with HTTP2 um, advanced filtering. Now, Sam, I know you wanted to get into the web socket a little bit. You had something planned. Is this a yeah, good time for me to hand that. that over to you? Sure, sure, sure. All right, and it's going to take me a minute to uh, move my monitors around and share my screen. All right, so give me a second. And I'm okay. starting from scratch here, so you're going to see me kind of launch everything. Uh, that is not my car, 
but you can see my desktop, right? All right. Um, so um, uh, Eve told me about this, and I was like, "Yes, WebSocket support." Uh, so let me uh, let me see what I can uh, show you, because like I immediately went back uh, uh, to look at like what kind of WebSocket traffic could I look at, and WebSockets is that you know uh, handshaking thing that uh, you know applications will do if you have a modern server and a client they can uh, talk web sockets and it's a lower level connection and the communications are like it's it's a, a bi-directional pipeline right so um, if you are using something um, just that only sniffs network traffic you're going to just see one connection and everything goes um, uh, over that so uh, Eve I immediately went back to uh, you know I, I work quite a bit uh, or I had in the past with uh, technological signal are, which uh -huh. is real-time communications, you know, for uh, all sorts of apps, web apps, you know, desktop and, and mobile apps. Uh, so I immediately went back uh, looking for that and Visual Studio is trying to update. So let's close that out. Um, so let me show you what this uh, is. Uh, no, not that small. There you go. All right. So I have a super simple web app here. Um, and the only thing, this is an ASP.NET MVC web app. Uh, the only thing I have added here is there is a dependency on SignalR, which is one NuGet package. And on the uh, on the service side, we have this one method that called, that says send message. Uh, that's all that this method knows how to do. And it's inheriting of a chat hub, which is essentially just kind of a hub of communications. So it is the thing that every client connects up to, and then they, we can broadcast messages to every client or you know individual clients or a group of clients. So uh, whenever anybody invokes this method on the server side, the server turns around and calls this receive message on whichever client, could be a JavaScript client, could be a .NET client, and it just like essentially sends back what the user and the message is, in this case, the two parameters back. Um, so since this is an ASP.NET project, so on the server side, uh, what I have is just enabling SignalR. And uh, even though I'm going to run this locally, I am using an Azure SignalR service because the scaling part of SignalR gets uh, to be interesting. It's a lot of things that you're holding in memory. And I mean, you could have a thousand clients connected or you know a million uh, clients connected to the same hub. So you need that memory uh, that can elastically shrink or uh, grow. Um, so I'm using a little bit of Azure in here. Uh, beyond that, it's just a regular uh, you know client side project. On the web side of things, we are bringing in some JavaScript libraries, and uh, this is my view. So I have like one input tag, uh, one uh, one for the user, one for the message, and then I have a button. And when you click on that button, what happens is essentially a little bit of JavaScript. Uh, let me make sure you're still able to see my screen. And yeah, and let me know if the uh, code needs to be any bigger. So when I hit the send button, I'm essentially capturing the user's input and the message or the user's name and the message. And we are invoking the send message back on the server. And when the server sends something down, we are receiving it through receive message and we can show that information coming down, right? So uh, let's uh, go ahead and run this thing because this is the first app I uh, I went and looked uh, to see, does it work actually? Because this, um, this app, um, it's a web app, but it's going to run on... Uh, and actually, it came off on my different monitors. So let me bring that thing over. There you go. Um, so this is a simple web app that does, you know, real-time communications. Uh, so we can say Eve says hi, and I can send, and I can keep sending that. It's, it's very real-time. I can have multiple browser windows connected to the same hub. I can have a mobile device or a desktop app connecting to the same hub. Uh, but the point is... Uh, this traffic, since this is Chrome, since I have a modern, uh, uh, you know, server and a client, this happens over web sockets. They do a little bit of handshaking to figure it out, and then they talk web sockets, which is not something most, uh, you know, uh, uh, tools will let you capture, especially when you come when it comes to mobile or you know desktop apps. So Fiddler can help, and this is where you might see a little blip in the universe because I am bringing up Fiddler and switching my network uh, right in the middle of a stream, uh, which should be fine. It's Friday. Uh, so We're just going to go for it. It's Friday. We are going going for it. Yes. So I am running the latest uh, Fiddler. Uh, so if you want to see some of this functionality, make sure you uh, Or I mean, it's going to auto update nowadays. So Fiddler is going to come this up. Would be and, good. You'll show people the light mode too. Yes, yes, I like my life. <laughs> uh, so I, I get the same, uh, you know, getting started experience that you talked about. This is real nice, the, the browser capturing. And I like the mobile support. You know, I'm, I'm into mobile, so I, I like seeing my iOS and Android traffic. Okay, so it has started capturing all the things. Now, um, we're going to go in here and uh, do a refresh on this. 
And now we need to start, um, uh, you know, capturing a little or kind of filtering a little bit because I don't want to see all this stuff. So this is localhost, right? And this is where the app starts up. We have a bunch of uh, things in the body. This is the HTML that's being returned back. Let me collapse this a little bit more. And this is the HTTP one. Uh, I'm not as advanced in uh, here, Eve. Um, so it's uh, still an old school app, but it is actually um, doing a little bit of negotiation. So when the app starts up, uh, let me see if, if it's in the headers maybe. Um, uh, one of those things when the negotiation happens, uh, this is a true alive uh, thing, and I'm trying to see if it actually uh, tells me that it has been upgraded. Okay, right here. Um, so one of these uh, negotiation uh, things where the server and the client are trying to figure out what language can we talk, uh, what uh, you know framework can we talk on. Um, so uh, they do the math and they figure out that both they can both talk uh, web sockets. So you see that upgrade. That's when um, you have a you have a GUID, you have a token, and the whole communication happens over um, uh, over web sockets. And uh, a second here, um, I might take. Uh, Misho's camera down for a second uh, until he's back, maybe. Um, okay, so uh, you, when you see that uh, upgrade happen, you see that little uh, thing here in um, in uh, Fiddler. It says, hey, a tunnel is being used for WebSockets traffic. This is brand new. And uh, if I click on that and if I uh, start going in the inspector, you're going to see these messages. So see that protocol? Now it's just doing the you know keep alive thing between the client and server. You see the blue and the green. So now we could say uh, Eve said hello, and we could send, and we could say uh, Sam said hola, and send. Now this is now uh, purely coming in through WebSockets. You see that that's Eva in hello. This is JSON. So you can actually see that Sam and Ola. Now, if I actually uh, switch this to like a binary formatter, because like it's being flattened and sent over as JSON, I will still see the binary. It will not be as like human readable. Uh, but this is amazing, Eve. I can actually look into any WebSockets uh, traffic and see it uh, in the uh, in the inspector. Like they, they do have the handshake first. So uh -huh. as you can see, like in, if this was any other app, like we would be making an HTTP one or a two call. Uh, for everything that that our app is doing, but here, like the app is communicating between the server and the client, but you don't see any more responses uh, or requests from responses because it is not making any. It is just doing that one handshake and upgrading itself to a web sockets traffic. And beyond that, all of your messages, it's just open Fiddler conveniently just opens up one more tab because I was like looking for this yesterday. I was like, where, where is it capturing? And it's just like one more tab and everything is right here. And it is just so nice. And this one, in fact, is actually also, um, if I open this one up a little bit more, um, it's actually going to Azure. Uh, you can see the uh, thing here. That's my Azure service. So it's actually capturing uh, the WebSockets traffic between my browser client instance, which is this one, and my Azure backend. And everything is WebSockets. And this is beautiful. I just love it. Yeah, I think it's so helpful. And like what you said, you know, when you're working with like live updates or chat applications, like this is yeah. going to be uh, a huge feature that you're going to find useful. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I mean, I, I do the usual things with, uh, you know, Fiddler. Uh, like I keep all of my uh, usual stuff where I can like um, record uh, and I can get back to APIs quickly. And then uh, I still have uh, Fiddler Jam, uh, which is the other thing that, uh, you know, Eve mentioned. This is the browser plugin. So you get to see what the user is seeing um, and kind of record their traffic. And you don't need to install or have anything installed other than a browser extension. And all of that traffic is captured and brought uh, right back to Fiddler. And then uh, you can open it up right inside of Fiddler. And then, um, you know, then your dev teams and your first layer of support teams get to look at it. So pretty cool. Raptome is saying dark blue is my favorite theme. So, uh, you know, uh, that's that's our good friend Cindy. So Cindy is agreeing with your theme here, Eve. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I keep rolling with uh, light, light mode. I, I, I know I'm wrong, but uh, still, I have well, fun. No, there's no wrong. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, WebSockets, uh, you know, quickly in a nutshell. I'm going to pause this. And uh, um, uh, Eve, did you uh, have anything more to share uh, on the Fiddler front? Anything you want to uh, end yeah, with? Yeah, let me just share a roadmap. I know you always like to give a little glimpse into yeah. to what's Let's new. Let's bring your desktop back up. Yep, 
me go ahead and share my screen. You're already sharing, so okay. if we have the okay. exception. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so Fiddler Everywhere, you know, we'll be updating this here probably within the next few weeks, but we do have some things on the roadmap in terms of like performance suggestions, comparing some snapshots, uh, masking and deleting, you know, requests with sensitive data. That's a big one, mm. you know, with all the security concerns out there. Um, opportunity to save more features, compare requests, just a lot of big productivity gains that you're going to find. You know, bandwidth simulation. That's one thing we didn't really get into are all the things that you can do in terms of the mocking, you know, oh, with, yes. uh, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, or simulating like server drops or, you know, if CSS fails to load. These are all things that you can test. So you're never surprised, you know, what that result is going to be. Um, because yeah, this... at some point, everybody's website's going to fail or your API is going to go sideways and you don't know why. Right. Yes. And that's where Fielder Everywhere comes in to minimize the damage and get you back. Um, get you back to uh, where you need to be. No, th this bandwidth simulation thing hits very close to home as a mobile developer, because this is like the bane of our existence, like, you know, people switching networks and going in and out of traffic, and also just like slow traffic, right? So what happens if my CSS just doesn't make it or, you know, right. a JavaScript file doesn't get delivered on time? What's the experience like? So that's, and I mean, I, th I think we could do some of that uh, right now, but it takes a little bit of effort uh, trying to simulate all of those things. So if the team is thinking of, you know, helping us out, that, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's what, you know, we're focused on. It's pretty much, you know, giving you the opportunity to get these things without a lot of uh, like work, yeah. right? Making things mm -hmm. as easy as, uh, you know, a few clicks or a different tab or, you know, a right click versus, you know, the complicated setup that you'd have to do um, if you didn't have a tool like Fielder yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well said. And, you know, kudos to uh, you and, and the whole team. I think, uh, you know, the Fiddler team has really worked hard in the last, you know, two years to, uh, you know, deliver Fiddler Everywhere to where it is right now. Uh, yeah. It works on my Mac, works on Linux. <laughs> I, I love it. Works everywhere. Yeah. Hence the name, right? Yes. And I think that is one important distinction. You know, we do have a full um, time, you know, support team and development engineering team that works solely on Fiddler Everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can say that, you know, for a lot of um, alternative tools. So, yeah. I mean, there is a dedicated group behind this product who is um, excited and really is working to deliver, you know, the most that we can uh, without making it overly too complicated for you, right? There's so many different features of Field Everywhere, mm -hmm. right? You can make it your own. That's what's nice. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. use everything. You can kind of pick right. and choose. And I'm going to say this out loud, Eve, because I think, uh, I mean, this is this is public. We have talked about this in, in, in blog posts, but uh, Fiddler Everywhere to me is like one of the best examples of uh, dog fooding because, um, you know, folks might not know, it's actually uh, written in Angular and yes. it's using a lot of Kenda UI Angular. So when you see the Fiddler UI, it's a lot of the Kenda UI grids and widgets that you're seeing. So we are absolutely using our own stuff. Yeah, I think that's a great testament. Yeah. Cool, cool. Thank you, Eve, for Thank showing you. us all things Eve, uh, you know, Fiddler. Uh, I see Peter is still hanging out. Uh, uh, Misha went to get a drink, uh, which is understandable. <laughs> it's Friday evening. And Mr. Rick Helvich has been waiting patiently to talk about the thing that moves mountains for enterprises. That's reporting. All right, Hi. sir. Hi, Sam. How are you? I'm <laughs> hanging in there. I'm good. All right. The floor is yours if you want to start sharing your screen and we can talk reporting. Will do. Okay. You should have that now. Yeah, I see it. Going last this time. Well, uh, we're going to flip this uh, script a little bit. Maybe uh, webinar time, we're going to put you up front. Oh, I think this is my penalty box for going over over um, <laughs> on my time last time around. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah, so lots of good stuff in the, the R run release. Um, so let's go through some of the big features that we added. And I know um, behind the scenes, there's been a major amount of work done towards a um, multi-release feature, which will be coming in the future. So. I know uh, I know some things that we'll be talking about in the future on this. Yeah, and before you start, I'm going to um, um, point out this thing that Chatroom Fulschnabel, our friend, is pointing out. This is so on point. You know, we are living in a world where we have so much of data. Like, the big data is everywhere, and you're not going to make any sense of it unless you visualize it, unless you see it uh, summarized and customized to your needs. So, report it. Report is everything. 
Absolutely. So let's uh, let's see some of the new things that came out in R1 is we have a brand new scratch built um, report viewer uh, for Yay. React. And again, dog fooding some of our React components, I believe, um, in there. We'll have a chance to take a look at that a little bit later. So this is a way for somebody to, you know, if they were building a React application, just to throw in a viewer so that report can be viewed very easily in a React application. Absolutely. It's a front-end visualization for any of our rendered reports. And I guess let me let me take a step back and um, sort of deliver the the one line, one breath, no punctuation description of, uh, of, of uh, reporting for anyone who is their yes, first please. time joining yes. us. Okay. Deep breathing exercises. So telereporting is a .NET centric UI agnostic framework for adding scalable, performant, and beautiful reporting to your new and existing applications. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. That is like a classic elevator pitch. You said everything in one sentence. Um, well, I just took all the punctuation out of a three line uh the yeah, three line yeah. starter. No, no, no. It makes oh. sense. Like you can you can build, you know, it, it is a, a .NET um based solution, but like uh, to your point here, like how many report viewers do we have now? Uh somewhere in the neighborhood of uh seven or eight or nine. Wow. Every release there's a new report viewer. Mm -hmm. Last time we did this, we were talking about the report viewer for Win UI. Wow. Um there was a, a new one before that too, and there's always updates to them. Um so yeah, yeah I, I haven't yeah. come across a front end that we have not been able yeah, to put a viewer in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like literally like, whatever you might be doing for desktop or web, we, we have you covered. So if you're doing like desktop, like WPF, WinUI, all the Windows desktop things are good on the web, uh, you know, you could do straight up jQuery if that's your thing um, or, you know, uh, ASP.NET or Blazor or Angular or React. Uh, yeah, we got report viewers for everything now. Classic web forms if you're, yes. if you're still doing yeah, that. There you go. Um, yeah, and the .NET part uh, is totally separate too. So, I mean, if you don't have .NET in your front end, the service layer is completely um, asynchronous. So you can just spin up a microservice, which uh, speaking of microservices, uh, I think we now support minimal, U, uh, minimal API uh, with Excellent. .NET 6 in reporting. So you can definitely have that um, definite streamlined uh, uh, microservice layer there. So let's see, we have the React report viewer that just came out. One thing we added and we have been, for the last several releases, moving towards feature parity, um, complete feature parity with the web report designer. I mean, we've always had feature parity in that you could do things um, in both. The, uh, you could do everything in the web report designer that you could do in the standalone report designer. But as of um, the latest release and well, the last couple of releases, now it's as easy to do a lot of the things you could do in the platform component, which, you know, not to be understated is in, in to do everything you can do in a platform utility in a web utility, um, as far as uh, drag and drop and visual design um, is, is quite amazing. I mean, uh, it blows my mind. Like, I mean, Test Studio, uh, the designer, it's a full featured desktop app. And now we have replicated pretty much all of the functionality for the web. Yeah. So one of the things we added recently was um, in the well in this release in this release is the uh, ability to have a report book um, added to um, your report via the web report designer. So a report book is basically just a report of reports with a table of contents. Okay. So you can imagine okay. if you have a number of reports and you want to bind them together, you know, in a, in a logical way, you can add a report book. Uh, we added an asset manager into the web report designer too. So for storing web assets, whether it be a script, an image. Um, we'll take, we're going to actually play with that a little bit so uh, we can show okay. that off live and um, why you want to use that. Um, one of the big things we've been adding to the report design, the web um, report designer is sort of the, the visual cues when uh, laying something out. So we now have snap lines and visual indications to keep things aligned. And this is familiar, you know, when you're lining something up, you get that line down, you know, that connects two objects together to say that they are aligned along the, um, the X axis or so. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see that too, so just passively because it's baked into every report. I mean, again, classic desktop stuff, and I'm just amazed that you can do that on the web now. I know it's definitely making the web report designer just as fast um, for scratch boot reports as the as the platform designer was. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had some updates to some Visual Studio extensions uh, around platform. Uh, viewers that would be uh, WPF and uh, WinForms. So I think we we had some uh, needed updates to our um, our templates. 
So we went, we went ahead and updated those for you know the modern web. So now those are uh, fully .NET Core compliant um, with the, so the add new item, drop a report viewer into your application, easy peasy. We talked about the .NET Fix minimal API. That's uh, gonna be a great help. And this is just basically saying the, well, like what we've been talking about that the web report designer is now um, getting as capable as the standalone designer. Oh, and people can sign up for the Twitch screen, um, which you know, better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so do you want to jump in and look at some reporting, Sam? Sure, sure, let's do it. Okay, let's get rid of this page. So we usually build some some pretty fun reports uh, here together, right? We try um, to. So I think um, normally, you know, we do something kind of silly, but I thought this time around we do something a little more a little more serious, you know, for our serious customers. So everyone's doing stock reports lately. All we see is stock reports. So I thought we'd just do something a little different and look at some bonds. Uh, what type of bonds are you talking about? Oh, the best type of bonds. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, oh, there you go. James Look Bonds. Yeah. <laughs> I am reaching out to a web service for this data, so any latency, I will blame on that. Um, so we went ahead and we built a an API. Um, we built a report that connects to a movie database API and displays all of the um, all of the James Bond movies and kind of digs through the data a little bit to pull out some some key information. So we have a rough description of the movie. We can reference the uh, poster and uh, we're going through a collection of the cast to to dig out the actor who played James Bond in that movie. So I don't know about you, but I can never remember which actor in which movie uh, uh, who, who played Bond in which movie. So we have a nice little indication here. Yeah. You know, you, you got me started on this yesterday, so Rick and me were talking, and I am amazed at how many of these Bond movies I have not seen. So it's my weekend homework to at least see a couple. <laughs> I know, you better get started, Sam. Yeah, like uh, like the first one, like this this started way back, like 1960s, right? Or maybe even, maybe even uh, yeah. before. Yeah, well, let's look at the report. Uh, yeah, Dr. No, 1962. 1962, wow. October 7th. Yeah. Sean Connery, the original James Bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have um, this is implemented in a couple in a neat way, so we can go through a couple of the features here. But I can't, you know, I can't think of anything else that we could possibly want to know about these Bond movies. Uh, can you, Sam? I don't know. Something, something seems a little missing, maybe like his his toys. His toys. <laughs> what do you mean? You know the the fancy things he drives around and gives you know the villains a hard time. Oh, oh, you're talking about the cars. <laughs> yeah, the cars. Oh, I don't think uh, I don't think the car information was actually in this this API data set that I used. So you might have to help me out with that later. I I, I absolutely will, because like you got you got me interested with minimal APIs, and I I went looking yesterday. So uh, before you uh, move away, like that uh, report that you showed us, like that was running locally for you, right? So what type of um, uh, app was that? So I actually am, I'm using the Telerk report server as a repository okay. and management studio for, for the reports that I've been working on. Mm -hmm. So this is another utility that we offer. If you don't want to build a custom application from scratch, um, you can just uh, license the Telerk report server, which is a pre-built application, install it to your system um, in IIS. Um, uh, it's built for Windows and you get a sort of a full scale enterprise report environment um, sort of out of the gate. And there's everything built into it that you could possibly need, whether from um, user login, authentication, role-based management, all the way through, you know, report scheduling and delivery. So all yeah. the cool things you would build into your own custom application are kind of done for you. So if you don't want to build something yourself, um, you know, you can just use the one we built for you. It's a okay, great way to uh, manage reports, as you can see. I, I love this because I mean, uh, it, it's it's kind of like the turnkey solution we call it. Like, it's it's one thing to be able to just like design your reports, pull some data, but the moment you start delivering your reports to your users, they're going to ask for like some of the power users. They're going to ask for stuff like, where do I store this? Can I automate this so I get a report every Monday morning? And can I actually build my own report, which is kind of the scary thing for developers to hear. But if you give them access to some of the data objects, maybe they can design their own report. So, I mean, Report Server lets you do all of that. Absolutely. I used to build my own you know, uh, demos from scratch, um, recording the backend report warehousing. And 
this mm -hmm. just makes everything so much easier. So we can just focus on the on the the, the fun parts about creating reports and designing them. So yeah, let's. Foolish now is saying deliver a lot of business value with SQL reporting. Yeah, yeah, and and SQL reporting is still there again. Uh, uh, we don't say uh, you know bad things comp about competition, but like take a look at what uh, we can do out of the gate uh, and out of the box. Yes, I mean uh, so the report that I'm looking at is connected up to a web API, which isn't even mine. Um, it's uh, you know uh, licensed according to their terms, but um, you know it's it's uh, an external API that just returns JSON to me. So I didn't have to maintain anything in my environment. It's um, very easy to connect to anything, and of course you know we have normal ODBC too. So if you want to connect to your you know, your SQL um, database, of course, that's baked in. Sure. So I think um, maybe we'll take a minute or two and look at some of the features. Uh, there was a couple of uh, neat ways I did some data connectivity in the, the movie sub report, which I, um, I'm going to show off, uh, maybe uh, an expert tip, you know, along the way. Um, and then if you can help me out with that data source for the for the cars. Um, maybe I will. See I've, been, I've been tinkering, so I will. Well, well I, mean, I still have to build it and then deploy it, but I, I will try. Okay, okay. Well, clock sticking. <laughs> so let's take a look at the um, the movie sub report. So I didn't mention, but the way in the bond report that we get all of the movies is that I implemented a. Well, let me open this actually in the designer. That'll make it a little bit easier. So this is the web based designer, which comes baked into the report server as well. So. This is basically the entire contents of what we looked at. It's just a very simple report, header, footer, and I have a sub report baked in. And what a sub report is, is pretty much what it sounds like. It's not, it's another small report that's embedded in this report. So this is finding all of the Bond movies in a collection, which is part of the API. And basically I just get the ID of the movie and the name. Uh, but the, what the sub report ends up taking as a parameter, I'll open this in the designer as well. This gets uh, at runtime mm -hmm. a parameter for the specific video that I am interested in. So if you can see, I have a um, I have a picture box here, which is um, gets a URL to the poster. I had the field for the description, release date, and title, um, and then when we get to the actor's name, is where it gets interesting, because what I get back from this data source, which I'm actually going to show off uh, my new favorite tool, yeah, Fiddle Everywhere. What and, we and get you, back, and you you go dark mode as well. Like <laughs> yes, yes, I'm done. You're you're white hat Sam. I'm dark hat. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, make this a little bit bigger here. What I end up getting back from the oh, that's the collection database is the movies. What what I get back from um, the movie repository is in addition to the movie name, title, tagline, all that stuff, I get a collection called. Um, Credits. Uh, in that, in that, I have two objects: uh, a collection called cast and another one called, I think, production. So they split the credits up, and then cast is one object with certain fields, um, and it's different from from the other um, uh, production object, which has different fields. So now we're three levels deep in our in our JSON repository. Mm -hmm. So um, you can see here is where we'd actually find the actor, Pierce Brosnan, and um, the character. James Bond. So it's an interesting problem. How do I get this data out into my report? Keep in mind, I'm looking at one movie here. Now I have a right. triple nested complex object um, mm -hmm. in this data set. So how do I get from that to and the specific also, actor? Also, before you get to that, like, is this sub-reporting thing, is this new or has this been around? No, so reporting has been in there for at least 10 years. I mean, oh, I don't know so when they easy. added it, but it was before <laughs> before I joined the company. <laughs> huh. See, I, I should use more of this because like you can have this like shared thing across multiple reports then. Absolutely. So this report, this movie sub report can be used in anything. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be used in James Bond movies. You could you know, reference a different collection, pull this sure. in, and you're still going to have these same fundamental fields. The only thing that I think you would have to change is I have the... Um, the character's name hard coded as James Bond, so that's what it's looking for. Yeah, but yeah. I could easily build that into a, uh, a second parameter in addition to movie ID. So, so quick question here from the chat room: Foolish Neville is asking, and uh, I'll, I'll let you weigh in on this. Like, uh, what about like gRPC support? And my two cents is like it, it doesn't care as long as there is some JSON, some schema coming back. 
uh, we can we can tie in, we can uh, build a report around it, and we could also do some dynamic things. So, Rick, what's your take? Um, yeah, I mean, you can really work with with any data that you want. Um, uh, I haven't really come across anything that you couldn't find some way to work with in reference. So, I don't think that would be an issue at all. Yeah. Actually, okay, I think so there's still there's still legacy baked in support for binding directly to a .NET two data table. <laughs> ADO so, if, 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 if that's it, not not even ADO, pre ADO. Oh, it's before pre ADO. Yeah. Wow. So if, if that's your jam, I mean, uh... yeah. Okay. All right. So you were trying to pull out the actor name. Yep. And I'm going to do this somewhat quickly. So the 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 master trick for this is in reporting we have uh, tables. So a table can be separately bound um, to the the bound to a different data set than the rest of the report. So you could have a table in a report that's connected to some different set of data. Pretty simple. Well, what we also have is a list. So what's a list, you might ask? A list is basically just a one by one table <laughs> at the core. So it's a single row, single column, single cell. Um, but that does give me the, the ability to, within that list, um, to uh, do a different data binding. So what you can do, and this isn't you know, overly complicated, is you can go bind the data source property, and you can use um, the rich referencing and uh, the rich expression engine built into the reporting to say something like, I want the data source of this container, a list, to be the report item, mm -hmm. a data object, and then drill into that, the credits, and then drill into that, the cast. And that gets us down to the specific object we're looking at. So now we have one object with one collection of fields that is referenced for this container. Now, in that container, you can embed whatever you like. In this case, I just embedded a text box. And I tell the text box I wanted to find the specific, the specific field called name. And the only thing you had to do at that point was back on the list, I added a filter look at here and I say filter that collection of, of characters um, mm -hmm. to the single entity called James Bond since there is only ever one James Bond in any one movie I'm guaranteed to get one um, one record back so then I can reference the character and that is a way to get a specific record out yeah. of a nested collection yeah yeah this is cool so I hope that was clear. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, you're essentially daisy chaining and reading one of the data source and treating it as uh, the thing that drives the other list. And because this is all based around the specific movie that's passed in, it's always going to be relevant to you know this this entry. So, if uh, you want to help me out with that uh, collection of cards, we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll see I'll, if we can. I'll try. But um, is there anything you wanted to um, uh, talk about the React? I mean, it's, it's just pretty much like opening up a React, um, you know, project and dropping in uh, a viewer. Sure, let's go to uh, VS Code. Oh, you have it right there. <laughs> See, I've been curious so thinking I, about this. OK, so generic yeah, I, report viewer, just one component. And yeah, just one component. I built this the other night. There's really not much to add. I only had to open two files. So this is a um, create, rack, uh, create, re create React app command mm -hmm. to get the basic framework. And then I just came in and I added a little bit of uh, a little bit of headers and um, I included uh, a NuGet package for the, the viewer. Uh, this is all documented step by step. So no one frantically take notes. Um, I just added, you know, I, I ran um, uh, NPM and got a um, uh, they got the correct package for the viewer, import it one, um, here, one line of code, and then I just copy and pasted the <laughs> this from uh, our documentation. So from here, I'm telling it to point to my report server, which is running locally, yeah. but this could be running anywhere you have access to. Um, and then I am sort of hard coding the one report I wanted to look at. So yeah, in a yep. yeah, in a in a larger application, you would have this be some kind of um, picker of some sort. You would select something from there. Um, and you would code it that way. This is what I was talking about before around management of reports and front-end viewers. I would have to do some coding, you know, to build up something for um, for the application. Report server would have it all for me. So you just ask for the report you want by name. This is the, the folder that's in within report server. 
And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's really not, not much else to show. Yeah. I, have, I have a couple of styles in here, you know, and, and things like that. But yeah, you just uh, run that as normal. Oh, look at that, start. And then while this is coming up, like I was doing some Angular stuff earlier in the week, like the Angular experience is the same. Like you start with Angular CLI, you bring in uh, like a couple of packages and references, and then you're up and running. And look at that React app and it's connecting and the reports and rendering screen. on the back end. It should be mm -hmm. pages to be streaming in now behind the scenes. And yep, there nice. we go. Nice. Very nice. Love it. I don't know if um, our good friend Catherine is still in the chat room, but uh, this is delightful for you know React devs that you don't have to do anything. I mean, it's all HTML, but the wrapper just makes it so much easier. Let's look at the. Uh, print preview. So this is this is a what it would look like if I were to hit uh, control P and you know waste six sheets six sheets of paper in about twenty five dollars worth of ink. Um, it would come out looking something like this. Uh, yeah, pretty so much get high a, fidelity pretty much as is. You get an idea of what it would look like. Yeah. So yeah I can see here there's a little bit of extra space. So if I'm a designer and I think this might be printed, I might come in and I might try and uh, optimize the size of this um, sub report a little bit, maybe shrink things down, you know, five or ten percent, see if I can squeeze one more in to my eight and a half by eleven. Or maybe yeah. I you know decrease my margins you know slightly and um, you know, make make it so we can fit a little bit more. But it's nice to get a view of what that's going to look like. And of course that is going to be the same as when I export it to PDF. You should get a PDF version um, of the of the report. Yeah. Which should have saved somewhere. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I mean oh, probably on your other monitor. There it goes. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Took it a minute to come up. Yeah, nice. So this is what I mean when I say uh, pixel perfect rendering. Regardless, regardless of which format you choose to render this report as, it's, it's going to look exactly the same, with the single exception of uh, a CSV file, which is our our consideration for the the data scientists out there who don't necessarily care mm -hmm. what it looks like as long as they can you know write some expressions against it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, and uh, nothing says printing more like you know. Anytime anybody says like, let's go print a report, I just remember like Office Space and <laughs> them just you know, destroying the printer uh, out of frustration. Okay, so you got the Bond movies, and uh, you know, scheduled time we had like you know uh, noon to and uh, oh, Full Travel loves CSVs, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I got like sixteen minutes to try to give you an API for the cars. Yes. That's gonna be fun. All right, let's uh, let's try. Uh, before we switch, is there anything else you wanted to mention, uh, Rick? Um, well, we hit the high points, so I think yeah. a few things will come up along the way, uh, which I'll show off. Um, but yeah, okay. uh, all right, let's let's try. Uh, need, need the data. I got, I got fifteen minutes, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Share. There you go. You're looking at my desktop again. Okay. So Rick um, sent me uh, this. Uh, wonderful uh, URL. So he's got all the movies, and he wants uh, the Bond toys to show up. Uh, and I didn't even know like they used so many toys in here. The Bentleys are there, uh, the Aston Martins, obviously. But along the way, they used uh, some weird ones, like Mercury Cougar or you know Ford Mustang is okay. But there's like a Indian auto rickshaw in there, like <laughs> just that. I I uh, need to watch that movie. Like. <laughs> Bond is known for gadgets. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, look at this one, the Rolls Royce, Silver Cloud, uh, like classic antique. And then you get to the, you can uh, in fact like see the Aston Martins going from like the five engine to the eight <laughs> engine, and then the twelve, uh, like the V twelve Vanquish was uh, like a beast, like this this one here, uh, and then the latest one, uh, this one uh, was you know, this is Casino Royale because they used a, a few, um, they used a new one in the No Time to Die. I don't think it it was in this. This list, but I, I looked it up. It was another Aston Martin V12. Um, so this is what we are trying to get for Rick uh, to kind of pull and show in, in his reports. Uh, so the Bond movies are there, and he's got an ID behind every movie. Uh, and I'm trying to get him uh, some data to bring in all the cars. So based on his API, and I looked through this, and I tried handwriting some stuff here. So uh, I have a text file here called bond.txt. So let's open this up and I'll show you what I'm thinking. Um, so it's a plain text file and it's super small here to read, but you can see what I'm doing here is I'm creating a C-sharp record called 
you know, fancy Bond car. And the record has an ID. It has a movie name, uh, which is not something like Rick needs, but I mean, I stuck it in just so I can see what it is. And it has a car name and I'm giving him a URI so he can pull up the image of the car, right? So that's my data. And that's pretty much written up uh, from scratch based on that website that I showed you. Um, so let's actually uh, try to get an API going. So one thing I will do is, uh, you know, get a terminal going. And this is the new stuff. So I'm running on .NET 6. Uh, so if I do a .NET, uh, you know, version, you can see that I have uh, .NET 6 uh, 0 101. Uh, so let's try, uh, try pulling up something new here. And uh, Lotus Esprit. Yes, Lotus Esprit is in there. Uh, oh, hold on. CLI projects is where I keep my stuff. Okay, so I want to make a new directory here and let's just call it bond minimal API, right? And we're going to go in there, bond minimal API, not APU, there. Uh, and if I do a .NET new, uh, let's do a list, right? So this is all the templates that I have in modern .NET. And I can do the traditional, you know, ASP.NET or Blazor stuff. Uh, it, like this one here, the ASP.NET Core Web API, this is the full Web API, right? This one has the full CRUD operations like create, read, update, and delete. And they're all exposed through like a controller. Uh, so you have all the bits and pieces to get going, but it's a little bit of drama for, you know, doing something so simple. And this is kind of what Microsoft is trying to get to is like lower the barrier to entry so somebody can get started quickly. So this one here, the ASP.NET Core uh, empty um, uh, template, this is what gets you the minimal API. So they're not forcing it, uh, uh, you to use it. You can still do the full API, but if you want to start real slim, uh, then this is your way. Uh, so I'm going to clear this out and we're going to do a .NET new uh, web, right? And what it's going to do is spin up just a minimal API project for me. And we're going to open this up in VS Code and see what it does. It is really, really lightweight. It's, I mean, it's a, there is a reason why it's called minimal, right? So um, if I look at uh, CS Proj, all it has is uh, the fact that, hey, I'm running on .NET 6. And it has this little thing called implicit usings because it's using C Sharp 10. It's using, uh, you know, something called global usings, which is happens to be near OBJ. So based on the type of project you're creating, they give you uh, a few namespaces. Uh, so you don't have to create namespaces. And even inside of your code, everything is like file scope. So you don't have to declare namespaces. You can, or in every file, you can just define them once with the global and then you're done. So this is the minimal API experience. It's literally three lines of code. Uh, we are getting the uh, C-sharp uh, .NET host builder. We are creating a web app, and we are saying map get to that URL whack uh, to hello world and app.run. App .run. Four lines of code. Remember, like all of our usings are gone. There are no namespaces that I'm declaring. So if I simply fire this up .NET run, so what you're going to see is it being compiled and uh, everything is very minimal and you just only saw the get, but you can do a post, you can do a delete or, you know, other things. Um, so this one is pointing at, let's say this one here, localhost 5119. Oop, I didn't copy. So copy and let's head over to our browser here and we are going to do that. Uh, and out comes uh, hello world because that's kind of what our API was. So that's just the default experience, right? So we're going to stop this and bring in our bond stuff. Uh, so where was this? First thing is, uh, let's bring in uh, the C Sharp record that I need. So that can just go in anywhere here. So now I have a record where I'm trying to bring in the bond cars. And I need to uh, open this up. So uh, I need to do another map get, right? And uh, what do we want to call it? Say bond cars maybe um so sure. if you come to that url and let's actually make that a url or a uh, routing path essentially uh if you come to that what i want to serve you is um it's a little bit of c sharp 10 here so you know delegate and lambda expression i want to serve you a new collection of uh, what is it called fancy bond cars right so it's an array that i want to serve you and open that and then we can close this. So that's what I want to serve you, right? So I'm going to go in here uh, and now I'm ready. And again, obviously don't uh, do this um, in production where I'm just like writing it up all in line. Um, what's Chatroom saying? Uh, this is a great bonding session. 
<laughs> I love it because, like, uh, in, uh, like earlier in the hour, like uh, Peter was deploying agents and uh, agents for Docker. This is a great bonding session. Yes, namespace is a very mistake. Heard here first. Yeah, you could say that it did, 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 does clutter things up a little bit. Now everything is in a default namespace. If I want it, I can just have one namespace per file and uh, call it a day. Okay, so now this is the reason why I had this typed up because I can just bring this whole thing in. Um, without you having me seeing uh, the IDs and bringing in these URLs. There you go. Copy that and paste. Ooh, it's a lot. Let's see what uh, what did I do wrong. Uh, no, I think I think we're good. Uh, things are not formatted right, but that's that's fine. It should still work. Uh, so we are newing up a collection of fancy Bond cars, and there is their IDs that uh, you know Rick needs because these are the same IDs that he has from his API. And I have the movie names, and I have the uh, type of car, and I have a URL. Uh, let's see if I'm ending things right. Uh, I should be. Uh, yeah, so that's it. So now let's give this a try. Let's give this a try. So .NET run again. And I have literally newed up a, a collection, an array of things. All right, localhost 5119, right? So let's go to localhost. Um, 5119. I should still have a hello world. Yeah. And then if I go to bond cars, yay, I got I got the API, but it's really ugly. I'm not sure why, because it's JSON. Oh, and actually this uh, this might make Eve happy because I can actually copy this and hold on. I can make sure my API is good before I hand it off uh, to somebody. Uh, so out comes fiddler everywhere. Uh, Agent Docker with the right to kill. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Uh, so again, if you're you know kind of building APIs, use the composer in Fiddler everywhere. You don't need network capture for everywhere else, but for your APIs, you need to know what's going on. So I go into the composer tab and I just paste that thing in. Localhost, bond cars, HTTP one, execute. And out comes a nice little formatted JSON. Look at that. So I got the IDs and everything is in a collection, right? And I got movie names, car names, exactly as you hope. I think that there's like 20 of them in there. Okay, so my API is good, right? Uh, now, next challenge is how does Rick get it? <laughs> uh, so uh, while this thing is running, um, one of my favorite ways to get to stuff or you know, uh, expose your local machine to somebody else is this thing called NROC. Right, and uh, they, they got like paid and uh, you know free subscription models, but this thing is really nice if you have to just test. So I actually have this thing, uh, ex, uh, you know, installed. What it does is just like uh, does a little hole uh, through the firewalls and you know lets you get to your local host. So let's let's do that first, and then I want to actually um, uh, publish this as well. We, we'll see if I can do this live. Uh, new window, and let's see. If I can make this any bigger. Okay, there we go. So it is in my applications directory. And if I do an ngroc, I think, yeah, we're up. So we'll still do ngroc, but we are saying let's open up an HTTP pipe. And my URL is, I don't need the bond cards. I want the whole like local host like that. Uh, let's see if that'll work. Okay, there we go. Uh, so Rick, I am going to copy this whole URL and send it over to you in chat and see okay. what you can play around and do um, in our private chat, OK? Uh, and it, it's open, so uh, folks, don't don't hammer on it. It's it's a tiny little local host thing. Uh, but let me make sure it is still good. Uh, that's my URL. And oh, big red. Oh, no, this is just Chrome saying, hey, this is not safe because my certificate isn't there. Uh, visit the site anyways. Oh, there you go. I, I got hello world. And I, if I go to bond cars, I think, and there we go. So I have my JSON. So I will let uh, Rick play around with this for a minute. Uh, but while it's um, working, uh, I don't know if I can do this while it's running. Uh, maybe I need to pause it for a second. Um, uh, well, Rick, are you, are you able to see the API? Uh, yes, I'm testing it in uh, Fiddler Everywhere to see if I can get some records out of it. Oh, okay. Um, well, we could uh, we could run with that, which is running locally for me, 
or uh, it might take me a couple of minutes here. I could like publish this and uh, put it up on Azure. But I think for me to publish this, it, it's going to need me to um, pause running the app because then that's going to kill localhost again. Uh, so that's my ngrok. Uh, this this thing is still running. So um, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to publish uh, to a cloud service first, or do you want to start with local? It looks good to me so far. I'm able to, to get some data out. So let me just do a oh, little, okay. little quick testing here and see if uh, see if we can let's, consume let's, this. Let's switch to yours then. Uh, okay. Well, I'm move move Windows back. Uh, you don't want to see that. Stop Whoa. screen. Yeah. Uh, let's let's look at uh, your desktop then. Okay. So <laughs> the local host service is running. You have a URL uh, and you're getting some data back in Fiddler. Look at that. Yeah, yeah you're doing like free free commercials for Fiddler. Looks well formatted to me. Good job, Sam. Yeah. Well, I didn't do anything other than just like hand typing it as JSON. <laughs> That's why I said good job. Yeah. <laughs> One missed comma and it's tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, this is the thing. Like it is so minimal. Like I didn't have to do any web API drama. It is just literally a text file exposed out as a as an API. OK, so while you were doing that, I built out a quick little framework here for, <clears throat> for um, the bond cars. So let's see if I can connect it up to, to that data source. So right now, it was based off of a, a little stub that you had sent me previously. So let's add a new web service data source within the oh, URL is, you sent me. This is making me nervous. You're running off my local host. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how, how you're, you're, you're nervous. Yeah, uh, there are no parameters to this, right? Just it's an no. all or it's an all or nothing. Um, yep. Let's see. Use real data and object, 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 hmm. object, object. Hmm. Was there a? Well, I think that might be okay. Let's see what happens. So let's go to data here for the report, switch the data source, and let's just do a quick preview, see what it looks like. No, I'm not getting any data back. Uh, maybe maybe it died. Let me let me try. Uh, do you have the uh, security on? Because like it's uh, Chrome is still giving me the uh, unsafe site thing, but it's still up. Um, so can you can you just go to the URL in your browser and see if you're getting it? That looks yeah, good. You, you are getting it. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, try. We are we are doing this live, folks. It doesn't get as <laughs> as real. Like across the internet, I am sharing an API that is running on my local machine, while Rick is trying to consume it in a report. Yeah, it's no cheating happening here. Yeah, yeah it's. Um... I'm. I might. Uh, I might uh, deploy this to Azure just in case. Uh, you know, we are, we are talking about uh, some of this stuff again next week with our webinar. I want to uh, keep you hanging off my local machine. <laughs> yeah, we're still spinning here. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe um, maybe we we are almost at time, so maybe we utilize uh, the time to maybe uh, I mean see if you can get anything. If not, I'm going to pause the service for a second and try a deployment and see if it's any better. OK, why don't you do that? And if you want to just leave my screen up, what I want to do is yeah, yeah. You, so you, you, you sent me right. one, one record earlier that you had hard coded. So yes. this is what it would look like in the report. OK, let's, you know, let's switch did, to that. What did I break? I broke something somewhere. Let's see. Or did you uh, like actually paste that one little JSON or like two records in there? I thought I did. I thought I did. Let me double check on that. Yeah, that should be in there. 
Oh, I see. So you're just hard coding like two records in there. Yeah, this is really good for testing since it being just yeah. static record in the in the uh, report body. So yeah, this should be able to be previewed. Maybe I didn't save it. Yeah, it looks like it's churning through some stuff. Hmm. Let me uh, let me switch to. Uh, let me turn my filter. I know what you did. I had a I had a filter on there. Oh, there okay. We go. Oh, nice. Okay, so th th there's the there's the two records. Yeah. So, and that came in from uh, the data you sent. Yes. So, if we go back to, do we do we have time, uh, Sam? Or yeah, we can go keep going. I mean, chat room okay. if you want to hang out. And then Peter, it's getting late for you. If you have to run, that's that's totally fine. Oh, Peter is hanging out with us. So I'm going to go back to my sub report. And I'm, okay. um, so we need a way to connect this to that other report. So uh, let's add a picture box. And as you can see, as I move this around, we talked about no, those uh, the highlighting. I can make sure that it's going to be yeah. lined up here nice. and lined up here. So I could, of course, um, take a picture and just uh, statically embed it in this image. And what that would do um, by default is it would embed that that actual uh, picture, the, the the data representation of that in the report body itself. So for a small little clip art, that's not that big of a deal. But if this is a large picture, you had a bunch of them, this would greatly increase the size of the report definition file, which you know mm -hmm. having a huge file makes it much less portable. So that's not optimal. Plus, it's not really repeatable or scalable. So let's look at the new asset store that we built into the um, built into the report. Uh, web designer asset manager we can open this and have a collection of assets available so i want to go here and upload um, just a little piece of uh, clip art so i have a <laughs> little icon of a car that i found and that's available for me here in the asset store i'm going to hit return click on my picture box and go to the value and then say for the value i want to get a value from assets and then i will pick this one and it should generate a preview for me let's see from assets not an expression Yeah, maybe it didn't get saved. And maybe. it's also Friday. Yeah. <laughs> well, nothing like doing it live. Yeah. It's odd. It keeps switching back to expression. It shouldn't, shouldn't and then can that. you save it like when you save file from assets? Yeah, it's auto defaulting back. Some Something about the way it is set up, maybe. Yeah, it is going to make expressions. Let me, let me publish this real quick. Maybe something isn't synchronized. Drop out of a couple of these and we'll go back in. Yeah, you had a lot of instances of that design open. Yeah. Oh. I need to actually go to the editing panel. Okay. And that's the wrong report. We're doing good, Sam. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Let's try that again. So that add a value. Fort saved. saved. Yeah. Well, it does say locked though. Is that the same as safe? Uh, locked means that it's um, it's a dirty report that hasn't been published. Um, I see. So until I actually click publish, this wouldn't be live in um, the report dashboard. Else you work on things and save it and preview without having to. Um, without having to go in and, uh, you know, without, without your changes being live and to actually publish it back. So, yeah, this isn't, um, yeah, this isn't behaving for me right now. I'm not, into, not entirely sure why. Yeah, yeah no worries. Uh, so, why don't we um, maybe try publishing so we can um, uh, show a legit, uh, legit service next time around? You want to try me doing that? Um, yeah, sure. This so, will be fun. Nothing like trying a deployment uh, 
on screen, right? Let's try it. All right, so uh, I'm switching screens here one time, uh, Rick, and let me know yep. if you want me to switch back to yours. Uh, right, um, so we were on ngrok, and I still have this running. Uh, so let's let's pause some things here. I'm going to stop this, and um, and I'm going to stop this one too. Yeah, terminate. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I actually didn't know how to do this because, like in Visual Studio, uh, you know, there, there's a whole saying that like friends don't let friends uh, right click and deploy to the cloud. But we're on the internet. What could go wrong? And uh, you know, you can all troll me uh, for doing this. But I found it. Uh, how you do that? There's a little extension in here um, on um, how to deploy directly from VS Code uh, to Azure. Um, so I, I have a bunch of you know Azure uh, subscriptions. So I got that extension. It's an app service extension, and uh, apparently you uh, install that extension and then you can deploy. But you need to actually build uh, for deployment first, which is through this command called .NET publish, right? So let's um, let's go back in there. Um, we are going to go into CLI projects and we are going to go into bond. What is it called? A min, min API? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And now we're going to do that um, uh, that command .NET publish. And essentially, what it should give us is let's let's go in here for a second and go. Uh, I actually have VS Code open already, so if I go look at the project, like it is literally just a project. I got program.cs and nothing else. I got a bin and OBJ for running local. But if I do this .NET publish, then essentially it creates a publish folder. See that WAC O? Like that's to say, like my output directory, I want that to be in the publish uh, folder and do a release, uh, do a build in release mode, right? So I think that's all I need. Uh, so it's going to fire up, you know, MS build and uh, whatever uh, .NET build needs, and it's done. And it's saying, hey, I did a build for you in publish. So if I go look at VS Code, and sure enough, there's like a publish directory which has all the things that I should need to deploy this thing uh, to anywhere I want. So I think um, next up we could um, see right click on the publish folder and deploy to web app. So uh, this is a publish folder. Oh, there you go. This is new because uh, I have the extension now deploy to web. And oh, nice. See, I'm already logged into Azure. So it uh, pulls up my uh, subscriptions. Okay. All right. So let's do Azure free trial. And oh, it pulls up my list of Azure app services. This is nice. I don't know, uh, Rick, if you saw this, like if you have Azure services, it can just all be pulled in inside of Visual Studio. Uh, so we want to create a new web app. And what do you want to call this, uh, Rick? Bond cars? That's, that was the end point. Yeah, yeah, that seems good to me. Bond cars, okay. Enter a global unique name for your new web app. Uh, press enter to confirm. Okay, let's see, somebody might have a bond car. Uh, no, it doesn't. Okay, runtime stack, uh, .NET 6 LTS. Is why would we go any any further back, right? Uh, pricing. Oh, so it's kind of stepping me through the same. Uh, so I could take the publish folder. I can go to the Azure portal and kind of step through this, or I can just do it all in VS Code. So it's essentially uh, stepping me through. Um, free, sure. Uh, yeah. How much can Rick hit my API? It's going to be free. <laughs> okay, it's creating a resource. Create a challenge resource them. Plan. <laughs> well, if you bring in automation like uh, Peter did, and if you have to hit my API like a thousand times a second, then it might break. Okay, creating new web app, bond cars. Can I see this? Uh, for some reason, it's scrolling a little off to the right. Can I minimize things a little bit? No, I still can't see what's on the right. Okay. I'll let it finish. And what did that do? Oh, it's deploying now. Yay, always always deploy to workspace. No? Uh, I can't read what's on the right. App service show output command. Uh, oh, there you go. Now I could uh, send it back. Deploying bond cars. Check output window for status. Oh, it's showing me what it's doing. Okay. Oh, look at that. It's packing up everything, zipping them up, and bond cars completed. Deployment to bond cars completed. What is my API then? Is it bond cars dot app service? Um, oh, it gives me a browser service stream logs, upload settings. Okay. 
browse websites. Yay, okay. Look at that, Rick, I did a deployment to Azure live. <laughs> uh, because this thing is just built in. See, that's my hello world, right? And uh, yeah, I think we called it bond cars. That, that was the endpoint. Yay. All right, uh, I'm going to let all of you folks have it now. Uh, chat room, if you, if you are wanting to ping at this. And also uh, for Rick, uh, who uh, didn't let me post. OK, no, YouTube didn't get the comment, but uh, Code is Live comment. So uh, Rick, I'm not sure if you're seeing the comments, but uh, that's the URL. So you don't have to go off my local host anymore. Now you have a legit uh, Azure URL to go off. Cool. See. So I'm done. Look at that. <laughs> I gave you an API that I hand typed. It is so <laughs> so lame, but uh, it's an API with uh, image URIs for his cars. I'm sure it's perfect. All right. Uh, TS load test. No, no, no. No, Andy, no. Bad Andy, do not load test this. <laughs> it is going to break. Or uh, I'm going to get a bill uh, at the end of the month, which uh, I'm not sure if I want to pay that. <laughs> All right. Um, I think Andy's gonna... volunteering to pay it, I think. Uh, yeah. Making that comment. Sure. OK, let's um, uh, move my windows around. And um, Rick, did you want to try anything more uh, with that API? or? Uh, I can bring up your desktop if you want. Um, no, I think uh, I think for right now we're good. Yeah, you you may have to just tinker around because like I did just do a publish and then you can you can tinker and get the right you know mapping between uh, the image and uh, the movie ID so you can pull it up. So uh, well, like they say, like live another day. Uh, like I haven't seen so many of these Bond movies. I think, it was, I think it's actually die another day. <laughs> die another day. Okay. So no, we don't want to die another day on next week. But for but, the webinar next week, we want to live another day and show this off. Well, actually, miraculously, now now it's it's uh, it's working. So if you have Wait, what? five okay. or ten minutes and <laughs> you want, you want to switch back, your uh, your screen is back on. Okay, so let's go back to what it was doing. You know, you know what you know what I did is I did a uh, a hard cache refresh on everything. Uh, I see. <laughs> so now, now everything is good. So let's uh, let's try that again. And I can't believe nobody else had this URL captured here. <laughs> so uh, for Andy or anybody else to hit it, like that's my URL. And uh, you know, with with Azure, like you have to have something unique. So apparently, nobody ever deployed a Bond Cars API. So we are the first. <laughs> Let's try. I see the little app icon. Now, are you using the uh, Azure URL or? Um, no, I haven't. Uh, haven't oh, you're still doing the JSON. Yes, so we're still in the we're still in the uh, the movie sub report. So okay. what what I did is um, I think it was uh, probably it might have been working all along, and I just didn't have the uh, mime type populated because I did notice that once you oh um, I see once once you select the asset from your store. And this is just probably expected behavior that I haven't come across. This is a, literally a brand new feature. Mm -hmm. Once you select the asset from the store, it seems like by default, it then in, will embed that in the report locally, um, at least mm -hmm. embed the expression. So it's probably just some nomenclature. So it seems to be referencing from the asset store, but calling it an expression. So that's probably just my mistake. But it seems to be working great now. We have our little icon. So what we can do is we take select that picture box again and we go to interactivity this is where all the fun stuff happens and go to mm -hmm. action we can go navigate to report and select a report source um, we're going to have a uri report source um, and bond cars .trdp. it's our mm -hmm. report format uh, i think let's see will that work no i think we have to do well let's try it let's try it and see what happens and while you're doing that, Chatroom is asking, has there ever been a mime bond villain? I, I don't know. A, a, a what bond? A mime? mime? A mime, yeah. Mime. I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, odd job didn't speak. Does that count? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, I need the um, R1 space 2022. Okay, so I need to put that and, in. Um, Eve, you've been you've been quiet. Eve, what's your favorite Bond movie? I don't know if I have a favorite one, but my favorite James Bond would be Pierce Bronson. 
Brosnan, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he, he was good. <laughs> Sean Connery was the classic. Uh, uh, I realize I'm getting old when I go back to didn't realize, you know, how old he is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and I actually have not watched, uh, even like some of the 80s ones that were in that list, I haven't seen those. So I'll try to convince the wife and see if we can watch an older Bond movie together. Yeah. I didn't realize there were so many though. So if you're going to oh, yeah, like do yeah. a marathon, that's a commitment. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is working. Now, remember what we talked about before, Sam, how a report is locked um, when it's in editing, but it's not uh, published mm -hmm. until, until you publish it. So this can uh, this can trip you up in testing sometimes. Um, yeah. When you when you think you've made changes to a report and it um, decides that it's not going to um, uh, you don't see those changes often it's because you didn't publish the report like i didn't hear for my bond cars report so if this wants to open for me i can publish it and also your your <laughs> chrome browser has been going for quite some time i don't know if you have like other caching things that are impacting it uh well, let's check And this is the time where I, I would almost always say like, oh, let me just kill Chrome and bring it back up. And then by killing Chrome, I kill all instances of Chrome and I just lose the connection to <laughs> our streaming service. And now you've, um, you've, you've warned me not to do that enough. Yeah. And it's actually harder to do in Windows than it is on Mac because Mac is like has like a global command that kills all instances. In Windows, you have to be explicitly killing uh, all of the browser windows. Oh, yeah, it seems like it doesn't want to behave. Yeah, today. it's yeah, it's lunchtime or yeah. you know late dinner time for a report designer as well. <laughs> uh, but you know, we'll we'll live okay. another day. It's going to be well, a new Bond, yeah. Bond movie. We'll live another week. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to touch that uh, that URI, um, uh, Rick. Oh, that, that that's the problem. It crashed. It was taking a long time to load because it was trying to access that web service API, which I put in there. Oh, which I have killed now. Which is which has been killed. Yeah, yeah. So okay. that had that, right. had the, that had the timeout. So Sam's fault. <laughs> Andy saying <laughs> lift report another day. Yes, yeah, that's our new Bond movie for next week. That's some but, good one-liners. Yeah, yeah, good bonding sessions. Uh, um, Rap to me is still around. It's late for you, Cindy. Oddly enough, I enjoy the Bond soundtracks more. Yeah, yeah, they, they got some good soundtracks. Yeah, you know, although, uh, you know, uh, Eve and you know, so many of our uh, folks on, on my team are, you know, so much into music and dancing. And as I grow old, like, I find like the best music uh, that lets me focus is silence just <laughs> just uh, uh sound cancellation headphones with just silence is the best music for me these days uh but anyways um so what's, we'll what's, uh, what's, what's the expression sam uh okay boomer <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay boomer thank you <laughs> right. okay i think this is going to you're no, still okay. trying. You're you're resilient. You're, yeah. you're fighting every cash, everything, uh, service-wise. We have to get to end with a, a success of some sort. <laughs> Throwing promises, chain stop error. Okay, I'm I'm gonna stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, all right, so um, I'm not going to touch the API anymore. Uh, it's yours to tinker, uh, and then uh, we'll show this off uh, for the webinar. Okay, sounds good to me. All right, we uh, we covered a plethora of things uh, on this stream itself. Um, yeah, your your JSON thing is still working. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Now it's working. So you can click right. on the car. You can get to the report. Nice. All you have to do now is add filtering by ID. But sure, sure. We'll save that for next time. Yay! Good stuff. That's a cliffhanger. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to bring your desktop down, uh, Rick. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Andy is appreciating us. There was a lot of stuff, uh, you know, for two hours. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us, Andy. We hope to have your presence uh, to help us answer questions because, uh, you know, we do get a lot of questions on the webinars. But uh, this was fun just to kind of like a behind the scenes look at how we are tinkering with stuff, how we are playing around. Um, and uh, you kind of saw us kind of use Fiddler. Like Eve is always talking about Fiddler, but uh, it's real when we are actually building out our APIs or building out our apps to be able to see the traffic. So yeah, it's good. Yeah. 
So we kind of started with Bond, uh, you know, with uh, Test Studio and doing um, some of the automation testing. I think uh, Peter went to IMDb, did four tests and, and came back with some failing, some uh, successful tests. We had uh, Misha show off some uh, mocking features, uh, especially the new on-demand instrumentation, which is uh, on-demand instrumentation, which uh, helps us performance-wise. And then all things Fiddler, all things reporting. Uh, so, you know, um, Andy and Full Schnabel and Raptime and everybody in the chat room, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, it's uh, late night for folks in Europe. It's mid morning, lunchtime for us. So we'll go have lunch and uh, Rick will not leave uh, reporting until it works. <laughs> uh, probably all day or all night, he'll be at it. All right, cool. So uh, Rick and uh, Andy or um, Eve, thank you so much uh, for you know, taking the time to come and show us all the new stuff. Yeah, it's fun to hang out with you guys. Of course. Yeah, always. All right, folks, uh, and uh, Cindy and Eva in the chat rooms. Uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out with us as well. Have a good night and uh, good rest of your day, folks. Uh, bye for us, and we'll see you on the next stream. All right. Bye. Bye. bye.